about 100,000 toads per year are saved through the data that we receive from toad patrols. And there are other patrols that possibly aren't sending us data. So it'll be more than 100,000. Unfortunately, the data also shows that lots of toads and other wildlife are killed on the roads. The, most of the toad patrollers will also um, report to us through their data, other amphibians that they've either rescued or seen dead and other normally small mammals that they've helped across the road. We've held this data set for over 30 years. And in 2017, Foglife, in partnership with the University of Zurich, undertook research on this data set. Unfortunately, the findings concluded that in the UK, the UK's common toads had decreased by 68% over the past 30 years. We then undertook a road mapping exercise and identified sites that we knew had substantial toad populations. We overlaid mapped road maps on these sites and discovered that almost all of the large toad population sites when, toad, when the toads start migrating, they would have to cross at least one road, in many cases, multi-roads. Multi um, this was obviously a strong indicator of why, the toad, why toad populations have declined. Since doing this research, Foglife has been very proactive in setting up new projects, thanks to funding from our huge list of donors, such as Esme Fairburn Foundation and National Lottery Heritage Fund. Um, we have set up toad projects across the UK, creating and restoring toad habitats, supporting toad patrols to install infrastructure, supporting volunteers and delivering a wide range engaging public public engagement program to help raise awareness of the issues facing toads. One of these uh, public engagement activities is our virtual reality experience, which unfortunately for the past year, we haven't been able to do the activity, uh, but it takes the user on a journey as a toad through a wildlife tunnel, and then they enter a nature reserve. And the impact on people's um, understanding of toads has been enormous through this activity. This leads me nicely onto the wildlife tunnel monitoring that we're doing. Foglife are monitoring wildlife tunnels across sites in the UK and Europe. We have 24 hour infrared cameras in these, in these tunnels that are capturing all species that are using the tunnels. Our data is showing that the tunnels are being used by the targeted species, which is normally great crested newts, but they're also being used by other amphibians, reptiles, and a lot of small mammals. We want to ensure these wildlife tunnels have been installed in sites that have been fragmented, where habitats have been fragmented by roads. We don't want habitats fragmented. We, we would rather that they didn't build the road and fragment the habitat. But if this is essential, then we want wildlife tunnels to become a standard part of the infrastructure for the new roads. In order to achieve this, we have our wildlife tunnel campaign. And if you haven't already signed up to this, please do so. We will post a link through the chat box. We need 100,000 signatures on this, on this campaign, and then we can get a debate in government and really get this issue right to the top of the, top of the government's agenda. <clears throat> wildlife mortality on roads is a global issue. It is having an enormous impact on the sustainability of many wildlife species across the globe. It is something that do we do need to challenge. We cannot continue to drive along our roads and accept as normal the carnage that we see on the side of the road, from badgers, deers, toads to reptiles. We have to stop this. We have over 400 people that have signed up to this webinar. This shows that there is a movement of people who do care about this matter. And collectively, we can do something to stop this. Finally, before I hand over to Roger, I would just like to thank Roger for chairing the sessions for us. I'd like to thank all our speakers who I'm sure have put together very um, informative presentations for us. And I'd like to thank the Foglife staff who have worked tirelessly to get this webinar um, in place. We will be taking questions at the end of all the talks. We will have a comfort break in the middle. And if you do have any questions, if you please post them in, your, in the Q&A box, 
and we will take questions from there. We won't be taking questions from the chat box. The chat box is there for you guys to all have a chat with each other. So please do post them through the Q&A. We will endeavor to answer as many questions as we can at the end. If we have missed a very important question, we will get back um, to everybody with the answer. Okay, over to Roger. Thank you, everyone. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Cathy, for that introduction and uh, particularly an introduction to Frog Life and its work. Um, it, normally at a conference, of course, you start off by uh, giving people instructions about where the toilets are and how to get out of the building if there's a fire. Uh, I think in this case, we don't need to uh, worry about those things. But uh, just to emphasize, we will have a comfort break of a few minutes um, about halfway through the formal presentations uh, and, and just a break. And that we'll take all the questions at the end rather than after uh, each talk. Uh, the, the subject of roads and uh, wildlife interactions uh, has become such a major uh, focus in recent years that there's now a, a, a sort of sub genre of uh, biology and conservation biology in particular called road ecology. Um, it's, uh, to my knowledge, published uh, two enormous books full of interesting papers on what's happening. And of course, we need to remember that although Frog Life is a UK based uh, charity, uh, working on this field, uh, roads are international and therefore the problem of roads and uh, wildlife interactions are international. And uh, that's uh, particularly uh, good to remember when we have here two speakers from other countries, one from Canada and one from India, which will emphasize to us that this is not uh, simply a UK based uh, problem. <clears throat> so I think we should uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention was, uh, uh, as many of you interested in conservation will be aware, uh, the RSPB uh, badges itself as being about wildlife in general and not just about birds any longer. But I think frog life can just about do the same because uh, our interests extend well beyond amphibians and reptiles. Many of our projects benefit other kinds of wildlife as well. And that's particularly true uh, of anything we are doing with uh, tunnels and mitigation of wildlife losses uh, on, uh, on roads. And uh, of course, uh, as part of that, one of our speakers today is Hugh Warwick, who's uh, best known for his work on hedgehogs rather than frogs and uh, uh, reptiles. <clears throat> so without any further ado, let's go on to the uh, next talk after that introduction from Cathy. Uh, and I'm delighted that we are able to uh, uh, welcome to our webinar today, uh, Devo uh, Sirkar from uh, India. Um, this is not the best uh, time period of the day for him. Uh, so we're particularly grateful that he's been able to participate uh, in this uh, session. Uh, Devo works for the Wildlife Trust of India, uh, which was founded in 1998. Um, the major wildlife uh, conservation organization that's an NGO in uh, India. Um, According to uh, Wikipedia, which never makes mistakes, of course, uh, it's got uh, over 150 professional staff and uh, something like 15 field stations. But if we think about the size of India and the scope of India, and its huge diversity of climates and uh, uh, landscapes and uh, geography and everything, uh, that's probably not enough. <laughs> I, I think to, to cover it well, we might need uh, even more. However, uh, the focus of uh, Wildlife Trust of India, several different major projects, but reducing human animal conflicts is uh, one of those. And since moving to uh, the headquarters, uh, Debo has been particularly interested in doing things uh, about the carnage on the roads. So his talk today is going to be about Roadwatch India. Debo. <clears throat> Thank you, Roger. Um, I hope I'm audible to everyone. Um, Good afternoon to all of you there, and uh, I'll be presenting on, as Roger said, on Roadwatch India. And like he said, like India is a diverse country; it's big, different habitats, different species, uh, which are impacted by the current onslaught of linear infrastructure that is happening. So I'll be sharing what we have been able to do, and uh, maybe in the future also learn about from other uh, established panelists that are there and try to uh, imbibe some of the positives that we can also take from there and try to use it in the field also. Um, I just will be sharing the presentation. Uh, if my video goes off, 
please uh, just hold on sorry i hope it's uh, visible yes it's here yeah we okay. can see it perfect. yeah perfect perfect so just <laughs> So um, to start off with, thank you again uh, for the introduction and uh, for having me for this online conference on this underrated yet an important topic on wildlife mortality on roads uh, that happens. I would like to introduce all to the Roadwatch project that uh, we in Wildlife Trust of India undertook and share with you an overview of the systems and how it helped us in addressing the issue at hand. Um, as Roger indicate, uh, indicated that uh, roads is a global issue and how it impacts uh, wildlife, uh, it's not limited to any continent. So uh, it is uh, observed to impact Indian wildlife particularly uh, very hard, but we didn't have the data to go forward. So this project was actually trying to uh, get an overview of what is the status of wildlife mortality on roads in India. Uh, just to uh, uh, share with you what we have done under Wildlife Trust of India. Uh, it's been uh, some time, like in, in the past 20 years, we have undertaken many projects on addressing specific issues emanating from the linear infrastructure projects and how it impacts Indian wildlife. Uh, we have undertaken uh, various projects in terms of addressing the national train hit uh, uh, a um, project which actually looked into uh, how railways impacted uh, elephant movement and uh, it's a it's one of i think it's the second largest cause of elephant mortality in india uh, apart from actual uh, uh, the human elephant conflict that happens usually uh, we have worked in different states in india and uh, uh, working on ground with the administration we have been able to reduce mortality of elephants in wherever we have worked Though a lot needs a uh, lot of things needs to be done more. Uh, if you move in the northeast part of India, we have worked on a species called golden langur. Uh, it is a critically endangered species and uh, used to get a lot of uh, rodent cases in that landscape. Uh, we prepared a bridge so that the langurs can actually move from one fragment of forest to another, and thereby reducing road hits. Uh, so a lot of work that gone into actually identifying which are the areas they used to cross. So these are important information that our biologists used to uh, record and we were able to actually get zero mortality for about two, three years that we worked there. Um, you must have heard about this place called Kaziranga. Uh, this is again in the Northeast uh, India, uh, one of the UNESCO World Heritage Site, and it is known for its uh, Indian horned rhinoceros. Uh, you must have heard that Kaziranga is a flood prone area and uh, we get, like it's a, it's annual basis that we get floods and because of these floods, the animals used to move into a higher grounds and road one of the national highways that actually crisscrosses Kaziranga National Park and a lot of animals comes on the road and are prone to road hits. So we have worked with the local organizations there and was able to assign people and watchers and uh, champions for these places and uh, who used to like restrict uh, vehicular trans, uh, movement in that landscape. And once they are uh, rescued from these road, uh, uh, pro, uh, these uh, prone places, we used to rescue and rehab them uh, back into the wild. So these are the kind of work that we have done over the years. Uh, the only thing that you will see uh, that these are all the flagships like whether you are working on a, um, Asian elephants, whether you have an iconic species like a golden langur or an Indian on rhinoceros, these are flagships and people get to know about whether an animal is dying because of this. But uh, there is an issue of how, what is the percentages of actually how these flagships are impacted by roads than the other lesser known ones or even critically endangered ones. So we wanted to learn more about what is happening in Indian roads impacting how the other species are getting impacted. So what we have done is trying to understand the issue and uh, just to get an idea about, because I see most of the people are from UK and other parts, uh, just to get an idea about how India stands in road hit cases. As Roger indicated that it is one of the 
17 megadiverse countries in the world. It also harbors about 8% of the known biodiversity, uh, global biodiversity. And if you see the map of India on your left, uh, most of the areas are crisscrossed by road networks. Though we have a lot of protected areas in India, uh, different habitats, different ecotypes, different species harbor these ecotypes, but the uh, how India is, right, it's a developing country and um, the need for infrastructure development is pretty high, especially um, in current years. And uh, it's uh, actually uh, impeding on most of the pristine habitats that we have. And uh, if you see that the road network, uh, I've given you a figure, but this is an ever-changing figure and we are increasing our road linear infrastructure like anything. And it doesn't take uh, much, um, much to figure out that uh, when the roads are impeding on these pristine habitats, the uh, number of wildlife mortality is increasing uh, in an exponential basis. And it is an inevitably, inevitability. Um, even what we are doing is we are making uh, uh, paved roads. Uh, we had a history of um, unpaved roads inside the forest areas, but we are making paved roads and they are here to stay. They have a permanent effect. And it's a known fact. And I see, I see uh, like most of the people know about this, that it is actually impacting uh, the habitat types uh, that we have. As I said, that uh, wildlife, uh, it impacts the flagships as well as other lesser known species. And it, whether it is from elephants to beetles, uh, it impacts all taxonomic life. Uh, road accidents, as it is known as road kill, it is actually um, surpasses hunting, uh, being the one of the major impact of how uh, mortality of various endangered species. And uh, it reduces the uh, habitat type. It fragments the habitat without beyond control, uh, which ultimately in turn impact the uh, uh, the species. It leads to its population decline. It leads to inter um, inbreeding, and uh, we never know. But it has. It may have caused caused uh, many of the species to go locally extinct. Uh, I just wanted to inform you. There are some graphic images coming, so please uh, bear with me. Uh, so, as I said, that a lot of charismatic species in India gets the limelight, but uh, there are many rare and endangered species of birds, amphibians, and small mammals, which are also never recorded. So, if you see uh, civets, leopards, though known, but uh, nobody cares about, like, there are a lot of uh, leopard mortality that happens on road, uh, gerbils, birds getting impacted by it snakes, uh, large ungulates even, uh, like the list is never ending. So what we thought is uh, we have worked in all these flagship species, but we needed to know the overall status of wildlife uh, that is being uh, impacted by it. And we needed more eyes and voices on the ground and nothing better than to initiate a citizen science initiative. And we came up with uh, the project Roadwatch. Uh, it's actually a mobile-based application, and uh, we have seen other uh, countries used it, but uh, this was never such uh, employed in India. And we wanted to use the learnings from there and uh, work out uh, what is the status of India's roads uh, with relation to wildlife mortality. So. In, it was launched in the year 2019, and we worked with one of UK's um, uh, chari wildlife charity foundations called David Shepherd Wildlife Foundation. And uh, this was the support that was provided by them was the first ever initiative that we were able to combine and uh, get our expertise in and uh, launch it. Uh, based upon meticulous understanding of what has happened in other countries, uh, we wanted to make it user friendly. Uh, we wanted to make it much more um, uh, like give, giving out much more accurate information and also uh, so that we can use this uh, information to actually bring about a change. So these are the few things that we wanted to have it in our system and we went for it. Uh, it actually works like uh, if, we, if it's someone who has an Android phone with them, if they are going through the road and they see that okay, a, a roadkill is there, so they can take a picture of it 
um, fill some of the uh, uh, forms that are there, mainly talking about the GPS and the uh, time of kill, and if they can identify several snake species and uh, amphibian species where there, some of them would be able to identify them, some of them would not be able to. So we provided that fields to them so that they can share with us as much data as possible. And what we were able to do is like create a dashboard of sort and it was accessible to all like all the registered users were able to see that whatever updates they are sharing from all across india they can see it and uh, understand the spatial distribution of wildlife mortality in india so what we were able to do is uh, make this uh, app and uh, we started by sharing it in uh, social media as much as possible uh, we used the hashtag uh, i break for wildlife and uh, the idea was to first uh, share it with the conservation fraternity and get their inputs. So it was uh, a lot of development that happened based upon the inputs from the team, uh, from the field teams. And then uh, also reach out to the larger uh, public at large because they are the, they are the eyes for us, uh, not just the conservation organ. It's about individuals who are uh, really thinking about this issue at hand, they can contribute to it. What we did is we reached out to many conservation icons. Plus, as you can see that in India, we have a fascination for Bollywood. And we reached out to uh, a very famous actress called uh, Dia Mirza, who is also the United Nations Environment uh, Programs uh, brand ambassador for uh, um, wildlife in India. And she was able to give a small uh, bite about why um, such issue and while what is wildlife mortality in India and what needs to be done. So if you can just play this video and uh, I hope it's audible as well. Adobe, I don't think we can hear it. Is it not audible? Well, it's not for me and somebody else has said it's not audible as well, yeah. Yeah, no, people are saying they can't hear it, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry then, um, so that's an issue, but I can share the, the presentation maybe later and then it can be shared. Okay, we are recording as well, so yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, so I'm just uh, paraphrasing on what she said is uh, like uh, she actually promoted this particular app and uh, reached out to her social media and she had a wider reach and this was shared and people started downloading like crazy and um, we had to like uh, really look into our servers to actually match the demand that was happening. Uh, but uh, we have been able to like work with her and uh, get as much information and much more mass appeal for this particular app. Um, so once we uh, dropped it out, it was available on uh, Google Play Store and the people can download it, it can download it. And uh, we've also partnered with 15 state NGOs uh, from the length and breadth of India. Actually, uh, we didn't have like one particular region in mind and we reached out to all these uh, local NGOs there and they started uh, uh, going on to these uh, road stretches where we were guessing, uh, showing a lot of uh, mortality cases and uh, they started serving these, serving these places as well as uh, they reached out to us and what can be done to address it. So I'll just take uh, a case study that we have. Um, this is uh, from Northeast India again, uh, in a state called West Bengal. Uh, just to uh, go back to that, uh, uh, throughout the tenure that we were running this particular project, we had about 5,000 entries, um, more than 5,000 entries across India. And if you can see the spatial distribution that we have of all the road watches cases. So this is not an updated map, but it was like uh, filled with all these pinpoints. Uh, and we can see like uh, most of, as was expected, that most of the cases were mostly for amphibians and uh, reptiles, about 52% were just that. Lesser known species mostly, actually. Uh, just to give you a case study of what we did in a place called uh, Gorumara National Park. This is, uh, if you can see the map, uh, 
This is nestled right in between Nepal and Bhutan. Again, very uh, rich in biodiversity. So uh, we actually, uh, this particular, if you see the right-hand side of the map and uh, the arrows that are pointing out. So this was actually a protected area called Goruna, uh, Gorumara National Park and a road of, I think, uh, 23 kilometer uh, of road was actually uh, bisecting this particular um, protected area and we were getting a lot of uh, mortality cases and if you can see that about 12 road kills per 10 kilometers and um, in the monsoon season season it increased like like enough uh, that we wanted to actually address this issue so we reached out to an organization called spore and uh, started understanding what is the issues that are driving such a uh, large mortality cases and uh, based upon the data that we get is again the reptiles and amphibians were the largest uh, loser in that sense and we see that around six mammal species 24 reptile species 13 amphibians were like identified from the record roadkill records but um, most of these cases again uh, some of the uh, uh, carcasses that we saw were beyond recognizable so we were not able to actually get a clear understanding of how many species actually got impacted um, we did a uh, seasonal survey in that particular stretch and we found that there's a temporal as well as seasonal variation in terms of how road kills are. Uh, we looked into the amphibian road kill and um, as expected, like the, most of these uh, cases were in between March and May and August, which is the monsoon season again for India. Uh, what we were able to identify is like these um, 30 north species or 10 odd species that were impacted by it, though these are not critically endangered species as per IUCN, but uh, they do, they are a scheduled species under India's Wildlife Protection Act. So uh, we were like really surprised looking just at the amphibian that, okay, that we need to do something about it. and. Uh, uh, we started getting much more, uh, we, we did an extensive survey, I think uh, for two seasons and uh, tried to find out what exactly was happening. What we found out is like, um, uh, as, I, as I can go back to the area that I showed, so the lower half of the uh, protected area, the line that actually bisects it, uh, the amphibians used to cross from one, uh, pool to another uh, during mating actually. And uh, because it was it had a very high uh, traffic uh, intensity, um, the frogs get attracted by the light. Actually, uh, the insects were attracted because of the light that used to pass and the frogs used to like come on the road and um, get impacted by it. So that was the major reason that we found. And uh, what we did is uh, we, uh, analyzed the data over two years and uh, came up with a uh, detailed project report about what is happening. And we submitted the data uh, to the state forest agencies as well as the district administration and said that, okay, this is what is happening. So, and we also reached out to the media because uh, if we just go to the administration here, it doesn't work. You know, you have to bring these uh, cases into limelight and we shared it with media, whether it is local or whether it is national. And we shared that, okay, this is what is happening in that particular stage. What immediately happened is uh, the, dip, the uh, administration actually at, um, uh, waited this uh, particular issue. They did their own survey and found out that this is actually a case. And what they did is actually put a night ban in that particular road. This particular road, uh, because if you see the map, uh, it's a chicken neck and a uh, lot of uh, vehicle used to go from the mainland India to the northeast part of India. And this is a major road that used to fly and a lot of uh, night traffic used to happen. And closing this road uh, at the night time was a major success that we were able to uh, take and uh, we were able to reduce the wildlife mortality to like considerable, considerable deduction we were able to do. So what I'm trying to say is like uh, this particular tool, the Roadwatch was able to provide a scientifically detailed, uh, scientifically, uh, scientific data to actually go with to the uh, um, administration. They had the proof, they had the photograph of all the road kills that we had, and they understood the issue. And based on the data, hard facts, as well as public uh, pressure that we were able to create through all of this, uh, we were able to get this judgment. So um, 
it is actually a helpful thing that we were able to do in that landscape. So this is just one case study. We have done it in other parts as well in uh, the state of Gujarat, and we are trying to expand uh, more uh, in the uh, in the coming years. Uh, so yeah, thank you for this, and uh, I am. Again, thank you, uh, Frog Life, for giving me this opportunity. And I would like to hear from the other panelists also of what they were able to do and try to learn much more of what uh, can be done in this place and maybe combine our learnings and try to figure out what can be done for uh, Indian wildlife and reduce the wildlife mortality on roads. Thank you. Roger, you're mute. Roger, you're mute. I'm unmute. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Deb. Well, that's a, a fascinating talk and uh, emphasizing just the vastness of the problems uh, India faces here, but also uh, hearteningly that uh, by providing some data, you've actually managed to get a partial solution to the right. problem. Um, yeah. I, I bet you it would be harder to get a night ban on traffic institutions in the UK than it is in India, but uh, maybe we should try that. Uh, it'll be really interesting. Uh, and I was uh, personally particularly interested to hear about cascade frogs because one of my recent papers is on the tadpoles of one okay. of the Nepalese cascade frogs. So unfortunately I've never been, but uh, I got some tadpoles. <laughs> yeah. So, thank you. right. Now, thank you very much. Uh, so we thank go you. on to the next talk. As we said, we're, we're not going to have breaks between the talks. Um, and our, uh, Next speaker is uh, Sarah Perkins, a senior lecturer at uh, University of Cardiff or Cardiff University. And I, we're going to see some uh, themes that probably runs right throughout this uh, webinar this afternoon uh, because uh, Debo's uh, presentation emphasized the importance of citizen science and citizen science is one of Sarah's uh, particular interests. Uh, like uh, most academics these days, uh, she has several uh, arrows to her bow, so to speak. She's uh, a disease ecologist, which is a very important thing these days, um, and uh, uh, interested in uh, interactions of human and wildlife diseases. So uh, that's very, very uh, good area to be in at the moment. Uh, but she also has an interest in citizen science and what uh, people can gather in the form of data. Um, I think all of us in a sort of conservation field realize that conservation biologists who are professionals, there aren't enough of us to go around to monitor what's really happening out there. Uh, and that in, enlisting the general public uh, is absolutely vital. So Sarah's uh, working on this kind of area for some time based in to us today about Sarah. Thanks very much, Roger. Um, and, and actually, I should say, with the citizen science aspect of this work, it actually, it started a little bit as almost, I call it my academic hobby, and it became so interesting that it actually became a central part of my research, uh, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So if I just share my screen. Hopefully you're all seeing my slides now. Great. Okay, so thanks very much for the opportunity to, to talk at this meeting and for Frog Life for putting this series of se uh, seminars together. That, that's really fabulous. And my talk is going to focus on life in the fast lane for wildlife in the UK. And actually, it might be little, not too much of a spoiler that the life in the fast lane can actually be quite devastating and end up as roadkill. So I'm going to introduce our citizen science project where we've tried to look at what this roadkill risk is for British wildlife. I should also right up front thank my graduate students. So Sarah, Aleri and Amy do a lot of the analysis on this. So thank you to them. So I'd like to start by just looking really broadly at the scope of the problem of roads globally. And this was a really nice paper that was published 
a few years ago in science by colleagues. And what they did was they took the whole world and asked, where are the roads? So everywhere you can see red on this global map is terrestrial landmass that is within one kilometer of a road. So most of Western Europe, North America, certainly most of the UK is within one kilometer of a road. So roads are an absolutely central part of our terrestrial ecosystem. And as Roger said right at the start, um, that, that roads are you know, becoming increasingly important and should really be thought about of being brought into road ecology. That's absolutely the case when we think that a fifth of the Earth's terrestrial surface is actually within one kilometer of a road. And the consequence of that is this, wildlife roadkill, wildlife vehicle collisions. So I'm sure that the people uh, watching this at home are thinking they've all seen wildlife roadkill. And this is actually a really common sight for us. And we were interested as part of our research to just poll how common this is. And a few years back, we asked whether people in, in the UK were seeing our wildlife either dead or alive. And for badgers, at least 95% of us are interacting with our wildlife by seeing it dead on the roads. And just a very small percentage of us are enjoying seeing badgers in the wild doing what badgers should do, you know, alive for feeding outside the set, playing with, with the young. So most of us are interacting with our wildlife now by seeing it dead on the roads. So I think we have this huge problem in the UK and also, does this become normalised for us? How do we actually conserve our species if we're seeing them dead on the road all the time? So I'm going to try some technology, and this may fail on me spectacularly, but uh, if you are able to perhaps use a smartphone while you're looking at this and put into the browser uh, menti.com, if you do that, menti.com will ask you for a code, and I have a question on there. I'd like you to answer. So if you go to menti.com, enter the code 10899682. You'll see my question there is, how many animals do you think are killed on the roads in the UK annually? And if this is working, I should start to see results popping up, but I wouldn't be surprised if this doesn't work on me, in which case I can just switch to another screen Ah, here we go. So hopefully you can see I've switched to this other screen and you can see some results coming in here of how many animals you all think are killed um, on the UK roads. So the estimates are from the hundreds, nobody's guessing in the hundreds, right up to the millions. Okay, so quite a spread of what people are thinking there. If I go back to this, it hasn't worked to come up here. But a few of you were guessing in the millions, some were saying in the thousands. Um, I'll stick my neck out here and say it's almost certainly in the millions. Millions of vertebrates are killed on the, the roads in the UK every single year. Uh, if you guessed in the hundreds of thousands, you'd be in lines with what most of the rest of the UK think. So we did a survey with U-Switch, the insurance company, and the respondents to that thought about 200,000 animals were killed on the roads each year in the UK. It's, it's orders of magnitude higher. So we have this real issue in the UK. Well, and also in India, it seems. So it's a global problem. So what can we do about it? We know that we have this problem. I think it's really important that we try and find out which species are affected by it, when that happens, and where the wildlife roadkill is, because then we might be able to start to do something about it. And of course, a big shout out for Toads on Roads project that looks specifically at species um, amphibians. And the spoiler is that I'm not going to be looking at amphibians. I'm just going to present our mammal and bird data here. I know Ben is talking later about amphibians. So what we did to try and get at this idea of which species, when and where, was set up something called Project Splatter. It is a UK wide, all species, any time of the year that you see something killed on the roads, you report it to us via social media. So hence the splatter 
that also is a little bit of an attention grabber. The, the media tend to really like that name, but it is this social media platform for estimating roadkill. So people report to us on Twitter, on Facebook. Now we've got our smartphone apps. We are developing a new app with Animex. Hi, Steve, I know you're watching. Um, and there's also our online form on our website. It's been hugely successful since we've started in 2013. We've had some 70,000 data points that have been reported by people like you. And, and hopefully we have some Project Splatter contributors watching. So with these 70,000 records, I want to show you some data analysis we've done to try and understand which species, when and where uh, we're getting wildlife roadkill in the UK. So a broad overview, which species do we get? So looking at the mammals, everything's reported to us really, but overwhelmingly it's the, it's the poor old badger that is reported a lot on the roads. We also often get asked about unusual things that we have reported and we've had the odd wallaby. So there are some small populations of wallabies, whether they're well established or not, but there's, there's some, a few weird invasives out there that get reported to us. In terms of the birds, okay, not strictly a wildlife species, although certainly some have probably gone feral um, and certainly not native. The poor old pheasant is really overwhelmingly the one that is getting reported to us. And an important thing about this, I think, is the huge amount of biomass that pheasants are potentially putting into the environment that scavengers may be reliant on but scavengers may also then be more prone to becoming roadkill themselves when they're feeding on roadkilled pheasants. So that's the which species. <clears throat> Thinking about when we get roadkill reported to us. So this shows our data over six years. 2013 is not included because we had a partial year of collection. 2020 is not included because as you all know, it's been quite a weird year, but I'm gonna come back to that with a few slides at the end. So we have from January to December, what we've got reported to us over the years with some kind of error around that. And what you can see is in March, here we just start to get into what is our, our time period when we're gonna get a sustained report of roadkill to us right until October. So it's really over that whole kind of spring to autumn time period, we'll get a lot of animals reported to us. Underlying this, of course, are species specific patterns. So if we just look at the mammals here, <coughs> excuse me, and this, this top one here is the badgers. So uh, you can see that there's a peak for the badgers about now. And what is happening is that these different patterns per species is likely due to breeding seasons, provisioning for young, and or juvenile dispersal if there's a second peak. So some of these mammal peaks are bimodal. There's two peaks there. And I think because we've got six years of data, I'm quite confident that what we're seeing year after year is patterns that underlie the biology of each of these different species. So I think there's some very interesting things we can do there in terms of looking at mitigation for individual species. Moving on to the birds, when do we have birds reported to us? You can see that for quite a few of them, they're unimodal, so one peak compared to the, the mammals, apart from the pheasants. Um, the top row here with our birds of prey, there's, they're, they're quite inconsistent, perhaps to do with a very fluctuating food source of some of those. And the pheasants have this double peak. <clears throat> and what we think is happening there we wrote a paper about it, myself and Joe Madden. Joe Madden is a pheasant expert and had really great insight into these patterns. What we think is happening is in the, the, the late summer kind of autumn, that is the dispersal of, of the pheasants from the pens. And that's been happening for many, many years. But the spring peak was something new. <coughs> Excuse me. The spring peak is something new that had only just been noticed in, in kind of recent years with the Project Splatter data. And what's happening there is actually the supplementary feeding that the pheasants have is being removed. So they're having to go out and perhaps forage 
for uh, food. And any time you've got animals uh, provisioning for themselves, for the young, looking for um, partners, then they're going to come into contact with roads more. And so you get wildlife roadkill. So we've had the which species, uh, when we're getting reports, now it's the where. So it seems very obvious that perhaps roadkill risk is just a function of where species are. So we looked at this with some species distribution models and on the left is the roadkill risk, on the right is the species distribution using the NBN data and the two look like a mirror image really. Certainly for badgers at least, roadkill risk is a function of where badgers are. For other species, that's not the case. So if we look at gulls, we've got this species distribution all across the, the UK. But the roadkill risk is really highly elevated in urban areas. And this is possibly to do with a much higher density of gulls in the urban areas and the kind of reliance almost on that kind of food stealing behavior they've become very well known for. They have quite risky foraging behavior as well, perhaps. So they're quite often uh, feeding on roadkill on the road, which again could be make them more prone to being roadkill themselves. So for some species, it's a function of their actual distribution. For others, it's not. So for some very broad patterns in terms of road types. So if we look at which roads are most deadly, this just shows a figure with each of our different road types in the UK, a motorway, A road, B road, and minor road, and kind of a spatial look at where our, our hotspots are. What do we see for mammals and birds? Uh, well, it looks on the face of it like A roads were absolutely deadly. But if we add into this the percentage of the road network, you can see that actually minor roads are, are really what most of our roads are motorways our road network is very very low you know a very small amount of our road network is actually motorway but per capita per mile the motorways are deadly so per mile of motorway you might expect 12 road kill compared to one to five for a roads one to one for b roads and less than that for minor roads so motorways are really quite deadly given what they are um, given given the road kill that we see there so that was the where. So I said I'd talk a little bit, this is just my last few slides, about um, uh, this anthropause and the weird year that we're having. So COVID-19 has massively reduced our mobility. And we've all seen pictures in the press like this of animals overtaking our city. So there's, there's talk about animals are, are no longer disturbed, mostly perhaps because of the noise, the massive reduction in noise. There's been what's referred to as a global quietening. And this modern era, the Anthropocene that we're in, has taken a pause, hence the anthropause. This gives us an absolutely amazing opportunity to look to see what the effect of cars are on wildlife. It gives us a really robust ecological experiment, in fact. And Apple have made all of their mobility data available during the pandemic. And we've just plotted out the mobility data for the UK and a range of other countries we know that have good wildlife vehicle collision monitoring. And you can see that there's been this massive reduction, certainly in lockdown one back in April, um, a massive reduction in car use. So they're tracking what you're looking for in terms of your driving directions. So a massive re reduction in, in this first lockdown. So we thought, given we now have six years of, of data, six, seven years of data, we could look to see what effect that's having on our uh, wildlife roadkill reporting. And roads are a really integral part of our ecosystem, and we need to really build our road ecology and think about how roads are impacting the species we're trying to conserve. Which species do we get reported to us? Well, everything but badger and pheasant top the list for the mammals and the birds. When do we get roadkill reported? Year round, but March to October is a busy season, but it's very species specific, uh, with species having their peaks which relate to their underlying biology. Where are we finding roadkill? Well, motorways are quite deadly, 
but it's really a function of the distribution for some species, but there's something nuanced about others, for example, gulls. And the anthropause, the reduction in our mobility may have offered this brief respite. And I think we'll see some very interesting data that will start to um, emerge over the next year or two on what this anthropause has done to wildlife. So many thanks to you for listening, to all the members of the public for reporting data to us, to our collaborators, research assistants, our funding, and please do get involved um, and report Wildlife Roadkill to us. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very, very much, uh, Sarah. We would normally have, uh, as after other talks, a little round of applause, but uh, uh, we don't really have that today. Um, as I mentioned uh, at the start, uh, we're going to have a, a comfort break, uh, which will last uh, four minutes, uh, and uh, that will be now. So if you wish to go to the toilet or stand up and walk about or whatever you want to do, uh, we'll reconvene at uh, three minutes past two, okay? Um, and uh, as I say, we're not having questions until the end, but uh, I had lots of interesting things to think about from uh, Sarah's talk, and no doubt Four minutes. <clears throat>
Right. Hello, everybody. Are you all there? I think we can start again now. Um, so we've had uh, an introduction and uh, two talks. And uh, I noticed some of the chat uh, referred to uh, wondering about whether or not we should think of pheasants in the UK as wildlife, uh, an interesting question in itself, um, and uh, something that perhaps will come up in the Q&A. Um, I also noticed uh, Sarah's mention of wallabies, um, and uh, re remember that when I was studying uh, at the field station in Loch Lomond, uh, there's a large colony of wallabies on one of the islands, uh, being told that uh, some Australians had, coming home from the pub along the Loch Roman Road um, decided that perhaps they'd better give up alcohol after seeing a couple of wallabies jumping across the road and thinking that they must be seeing nightmares. But uh, indeed, there are wallabies in certain places in the UK. So, okay, we now go on to uh, our next presentation, which is going to be given by uh, Sean uh, Boyle, uh, who's a postdoctoral researcher. Uh, Memorial University in Newfoundland. I guess Newfoundland is slightly better time zone than, say, being in Vancouver. Uh, last Canadian um, webinar talk I uh, was part of, uh, the speaker was in Vancouver. Terrible time zone for her to be talking in the UK. Um, so, uh, Sean, uh, on his postdoc, is uh, doing all sorts of interesting ecology, um, but his PhD project. Uh, was very much focused on uh, roadkill and wildlife road interactions. And I notice also uh, being a wee link with the first speaker with Devo's talk, um, that he also looked at the effects of railways on road, road, uh, road railways on wildlife. Uh, so there's a wee link there between India and Canada. So I'd like to hand over now to Sean for his talk on before, after, impact studies on mammals and amphibians in Ontario. Thanks, Roger. And uh, thanks everybody for joining me today. Um, I'm gonna be leaning into my screen a little bit just so everyone can hear me because I think my mic is not working perfectly, but I'm gonna load up my presentation quickly. All right. Um, yeah. So, uh, thanks for the introduction. I I'm a postdoc uh, postdoc at uh, Memorial University in Newfoundland, and uh, it definitely does have a better time zone. Uh, it's a three and a half hour difference, I think, for us. Um, and uh, largely, what I'm going to be talking about today, though, is the work that I did during my PhD that was focusing on the effects of uh, roads on wildlife, primarily reptiles and amphibians, but also mammals. Uh, and really kind of keying in on how effective wildlife mitigation can be and how we can go about determining how effective it is. Uh, before I get oh, before I get into it, I just want to take a, a second to recognize that Newfoundland, where I am, is the ancestral homeland of the Mi'kmaq and Ibotek, and that the Inuit of Natasiavit and Nanatukavit and the Inuit of Natasnan and their ancestors are the original people of Labrador. Uh, as well, much of the research presented here took place on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. So human land use is well documented as one of the most important uh, drivers of species decline. And uh, an important study came out a couple of years ago that suggested or, or linked human land use patterns to uh, um, over a million uh, species extinction in, in the next couple of decades. Uh, and this can come in a variety of forms. So forestry in the top left here, agriculture and urban centers. But the one thing that all of these different types of land use patterns have uh, is that roads are what connect them. We, we use roads to extract timber. We use roads to get uh, agricultural products to cities. And then obviously cities are densely packed with roads, but we use them to get in and out of cities to get to work uh, and access all of those resources that we're bringing in. And the result of that is this incredibly expansive road network globally. Uh, worldwide, there's over 50 million kilometers of roads. Uh, and this is 
an, a bit of an older estimate, but also a bit of an underestimate because it likely doesn't account for um, tertiary roads or kind of back roads. In the context of the research that I did uh, in Ontario, which is uh, located in the, the Great Lakes region of Canada, um, you get this kind of dark patch of road network in the southern portion of the province where most people live. Uh, and uh, the result is that there's not a single place in southern Ontario where you can be more than two and a half kilometers from a road. Uh, if you think about that from an animal's perspective, especially an animal who might move upwards of two or five kilometers a day, uh, that can drastically impact their ability to access resources as well as move about their habitats in, in natural ways. Roads can affect wildlife in a variety of ways. Obviously, uh, road mortality is the most apparent, um, but there's the effect of noise, light, uh, and uh, chemical pollution that can drive animals away. Um, but importantly, it's not just the impact of the road surface itself, uh, or that impact, or the impact of the road is not just limited to the location of the road. And depending on the the, the size of these stimuli, the noise, the light, the chemical pollution, um, the road effect zone around that road can be greater or smaller. Um, and for some species, this can be up to five or 10 kilometers, even that uh, would be considered degra degraded habitat um, uh, around that road surface. So the, the first question I kind of want to talk about is how can we reduce these negative effects? Uh, generally, there's two main ways of going about it. The first is changing human behavior. Uh, and this includes things like signage, uh, speed reductions, uh, and road closures, which I, I'm happy was mentioned in, uh, in India as well. Uh, this is an example from Burlington, where, uh, which is in Ontario, um, where there's a, a five week period every year, the road is closed off entirely for a salamander migration, uh, an endangered salamander migration. Uh, as far as I know, it's the only example uh, in Canada that is uh, this com complete. Um, but the problem with all of these is that, uh, you know, there's no guarantee of success. We can't, it, it's variable from location to location. Um, drivers often react to signage initially, but become habituated to that signage. And then so don't reduce their speeds in these important areas. Um, and so there's only so much that they can do. The second approach is typically this combination of wildlife fencing to keep animals off the road surface. And then that's usually paired with some sort of crossing structure um, that allows animals to travel along the fence and then cross through uh, the structure, whether it's above the road or under the road, so that uh, they can you know, maintain uh, connectivity on between either sides of the road. And these come in a variety of shapes and sizes. Obviously, uh, it's very species specific. They'll go from these kind of smaller models that you can see on the left here, all the way up to these massive uh, models that uh, two of these are in Canada. And I believe this one on the right is in the Netherlands that target large mammals. So when we think about the number of cars or vehicles traveling, traveling along the road, um, we often think that the number of vehicles is one of the kind of drivers of that road effect zone. Um, more cars mean a greater amount of noise, light, and chemical pollution, and so it would have a larger effect zone. Uh, but one of the ways that we can facilitate or accommodate um, increased traffic volume is to widen a road. Um, generally, uh, it's much less expensive to widen a road than to build an entirely new road. Uh, it's more efficient. And the thought is that it's potentially less damaging to, to wildlife, but uh, there's really almost no evidence to support this uh, until recently. And so I asked whether or not highway widening affected uh, the population and spatial ecology of large mammals. Um, again, the Specifically, I was interested in how many animals would be in the area surrounding a road and how close they were getting to the road. So over four winters in Sudbury, which is in central, north central Ontario, 
um, has fairly low road density, low population density. Um, we surveyed for large mammal tracks in the snow uh, around in the adjacent habitat uh, around a, a freshly twinned highway. Uh, you can see this highway on the right is uh, an aerial view of it, and there's a large mammal crossing structure that was built kind of in addition to this twinning project. Uh, this crossing tunnel on the bottom is another example of that. Um, we drove along the highway itself to look at what animals were getting on the highway, but specifically what I'm going to be talking about is where the animals were in the adjacent habitat and how many animals we were detecting. Uh, and what we found was that the highway widening seemed to have really no effect on how close animals were getting to the highway uh, or how many animals that there were uh, in that area around the highway. Um, this is really pro promising, obviously, uh, because if that's the, if highway widening is the more efficient option, uh, it's going to be the preferred option for um, road managers as well. We did notice some species specific trends, uh, which is not necessarily surprising. Uh, species such as coyote and fox are fairly well documented to uh, be able to habituate to human presence more than some species like moose. Um, however, we also noticed that the the proximity or the number of animals and the proximity of the animals to the road varied throughout the winter season. And so this might partially explain what we saw uh, in, in the sense that we expected that there would be some effect, but there wasn't. Generally, it seems though that highway widening is a good solution for accommodating increased traffic flow uh, compared to building new roads. But like I said, it could be a seasonal uh, effect. So what I mean by that is that highway widening or the, the highway widening in this project specifically was finished in the summer and we only monitored in the winter. So it's possible that the, uh, you know, the effect that this had on the wildlife population was um, kind of limited to the six months or so between the highway being finished and the highway um, being monitored again by us. We monitored both before and after, but um, even that though is still good news uh, because six months to habituate to a road um, suggests that the effects of that in that road effects zone are, are marginally different uh, if they are different. The next step that I really wanted to focus on was how effective mitigation really is. So these structures that we install are incredibly expensive. Uh, the bridge that I showed you uh, through that uh, in Sudbury um, was $3 million just by itself, uh, paired with, I think, three or four other crossing structures uh, that were slightly smaller, as well as about 20 kilometers of fencing. It was a very expensive mitigation project. Um, and generally we expect mitigation to be effective. Uh, we have lots of little bits of evidence suggesting that fencing keeps animals off roads uh, and that tunnels are used by wildlife, but generally the study design used um, ha has not really been able to give us a concrete uh, way of evaluating these structures, um, whether it be just a before after comparison or they compare a site that has mitigation to one that has no mitigation. Um, and kind of further to that, uh, there's only been one study that I know of uh, that has demonstrated genetic connectivity at the population level uh, for, and that was for large mammals. Um, and, and there's a few examples now of um, instances where incomplete fencing or fencing that is not installed correctly can actually increase road mortality because animals get trapped between uh, the fencing on either side of the road. <coughs> so um, what I did was in a provincial park in southern Ontario, you can see the star here on Lake Ontario. Uh, I monitored two sites, a site that uh, received mitigation and a site that didn't receive mitigation, so a control and an impact site. And I monitored those for six years. Uh, the six years accounted for three years before the mitigation was installed, 
the one summer where the mitigation was being installed, and then two summers following the installation of that mitigation. Uh, and so what that allowed me to do is kind of have this multi-year before after control impact design. Uh, and th that's considered one of the, the most robust ways of evaluating uh, these effects. But essentially uh, what it's assuming is that these two lines will be parallel throughout time if there's no effect. Uh, if there is an effect, you would notice this dip uh, over time corresponding to the mitigation being installed. And so really what you would find is that after mitigation, there would be fewer uh, animals found on the road relative to the control site. Uh, and like I said, we did daily surveys for six years uh, or six summers rather. We had a surveyor on both sites simultaneously. Uh, so it was a paired design. Uh, and we surveyed for about, we surveyed three times a day for about a hundred days each summer. Um, so we had a, a large amount of data that we could really kind of tease apart the effects with this. And what we found is that the fencing did in fact reduce uh, turtle and amphibian mortality, but interestingly, it didn't reduce it for snakes. Uh, so you can see here, um, uh, don't worry about the marginal effect. Essentially, this just refers to the, the, the log mean count of the number of animals we found uh, and was a result of the type of analysis we used. Um, but you can see turtles, this kind of uh, or um, the hash line drops down after mitigation, whereas the solid line continues on. For amphibians, uh, similarly, uh, but a little more counterintuitively, um, it's parallel up until the mitigation has been installed. And then at our control site, we actually saw a major increase in the number of animals we found on the road. But at our impact site, we didn't see that major increase. Uh, this kind of highlights the importance of why we had six years of, of uh, data collection. Uh, because if you had only surveyed for you know, one year on either side, it, it, you would miss a lot of those kind of natural environmental shifts, especially in a, a species or a, a taxon like frogs that kind of have these big population shifts from year to year. Um, but snakes, you know, you see this parallel line uh, over time. And, and so there was no effect. Uh, and the reason we think that this happened is that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the, we, the reason we think this happened is that the fencing was really designed with turtles in mind. Um, the fencing came in rolls of about 20 meter long rolls of plastic sheeting. And we buried that plastic sheeting and it was supported by stakes. But because of uh, the way the plastic would expand in the winter and the way the ground would heave the plastic in the winter, um, if we had fastened the plastic to each other, the two sheets to each other, it would just tear the fencing apart. Uh, and so these were just sheets that were kind of overlapped. And we tried to overlap them tightly with the poles. But uh, what we found was that snakes were just getting through the fence. Um, there was several instances where we noticed snakes seemed to actually be um, estivating in the fences, or at least basking in the fences. These are black fences, and so they soaked up a lot of heat. And so we think that maybe the snakes were staying in there because it was a safe space from predators um, that was also quite warm for them. Um, the other thing I just want to kind of dive back into a little bit is the, the variation that we saw both within a year and between a year. So uh, this is the more complicated version of our analysis. Um, and you can see the dashed impact line and the solid control line, similar to the previous graph. Uh, and you can see those lines coming together, which indicates that there's an effect. Um, but both the dips and troughs within a year, but also the shape of this line between years was drastically different. And so again, this kind of just highlights the importance of having both a multi-year or multi-years on, on both ends of the study, the before and the after, but also having that before after control impact uh, design to really tease apart these effects. We wanted to know whether or not the connectivity structures, the crossing structures, which we had two of, uh, could facilitate population level connectivity. And so 
the first step we did was we found, we just quantified the, the tunnel usage patterns and we found that there was quite a bit of variability um, between taxon or taxa. Uh, we demonstrated that there was no differences uh, between species, uh, between sex or between size classes in terms of their usage rates. So, you know, if we caught 30 snapping turtles and 30 painted turtles, they were just as likely to use those crossing structures, which is really good. It means that there's not going to be some sort of effect on one species, but not another, or lead to a sex bias within the population. Uh, and then finally, we really wanted to contextualize all this um, with a population estimate. And so we used a trapping program and we pit tagged animals that we uh, that we captured. Um, by pit tag, I just mean we installed or we gave them a bit of a microchip and then in the tunnels, the entrances to the tunnels, we had pit tag readers that would um, notify us whenever an animal had gone through the tunnel. Uh, and what we found was that we estimated that in the uh, area that we were trapping, so this was a fairly small area, it was just a couple hectares, uh, in the area that we were trapping, there was 143 painted turtles and 119 snapping turtles. Uh, and the, the results were a little bit mixed for these two. Uh, for painted turtles, only about 5% of the animals were using the structure, uh, which is not incredibly high, but uh, theoretically within the time frame of a turtle's uh, reproductive lifespan or generation time, which is about 20 to 30 years, 5% uh, should be enough to ensure genetic connectivity, but it is still a, a small number uh, and might indicate some sort of, uh, you know, limiting factor on their access to resources. Um, but snapping turtles were upwards of 15% of the population uh, using these crossing, crossing structures. So we think that that is, is very promising. We didn't have population estimates for Blanding's turtles uh, or garter snakes just because Blanding's turtles are quite rare uh, and then garter snakes uh, we weren't able to recapture the same way, um, but but 11% of landing turtles uh, seems promising, although take that with a grain of salt because we only captured nine, um, but then really promising garter snakes, um, almost 45% of the snakes that we captured were actually found using the tunnels. Uh, and a, a student who worked with me, <coughs> excuse me, a student who worked with me did another study uh, to determine how willing garter snakes were you to use these crossing structures and she found that um, for the most part they were quite willing to use it and they actually got more willing to use crossing structures which uh, I thought was incredibly fascinating. I don't know that I would go as far as saying the snakes were learning but uh, I thought that was very neat. <clears throat> so the the last thing I kind of want to talk about uh, is where we should place crossing structures or mitigation generally so they can be the most effective. And I actually collected this data um, and used this data, the, the data that I'm about to present to guide the mitigation uh, for the provincial park. Um, and so uh, I, I think that there's some validity to um, this kind of method. But generally, uh, there's a few ways that we can look at this. Uh, so the first and the most common way of identifying where mitigation is needed is to look at where animals are being killed. Uh, obviously, if a lot of animals are being killed in a specific location, uh, then those hot spots uh, are potentially a good location for why uh, or for, for uh, mitigation to be installed. Uh, however, there's a number of different things that are associated with that. So habitat types, um, the characteristics of the road, um, different species interacting with those species, as well as just the species in general. So there's no real one way of uh, kind of modeling where these structures should go without actually collecting the data itself. Um, kind of further complicating that issue is that uh, these locations are really species specific. And so if you're looking at targeting multiple species, you have uh, trouble kind of choosing between them. Uh, but also if um, a location has low mortality, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not an important location. It could mean that that's actually historically in a very important location and just it's received more mortality over time. 
uh, and so it has lower than average uh, mortality rates. An alternative to this is uh, landscape resistance mapping. Uh, and this is uh, using something called circuit theory that treats the landscape like a circuit board. Uh, and what you do is you have anodes and cathodes spread out around your study area and you cause current to travel through that study area. Uh, different parts of the, or different types of habitat will have different resistances to that current, uh, but that current is analogous to animal movement going through the habitat. Um, it's very cost and time effective. It can be done within a week uh, fairly easily, especially if you are familiar with the process. It's been shown to be effective for multiple species and several different taxa. <clears throat> um, and generally, if you want to identify where animals are on a large landscape scale, um, anywhere from hundreds of square kilometers to hundreds of thousands of square kilometers, uh, this is a really, really powerful tool. <coughs> uh, so what we did was we wanted to compare um, road crossing hotspots to this landscape resistance model. Uh, and so we use three surveys of the snow tracking data that I mentioned previously, as well as three summers of the reptile and amphibian surveys that we did. Uh, and just for context, uh, you know, we did probably about 45 surveys in the winter and then about 3,000 kilometers of cycling associated with collecting the reptile and amphibian data. Uh, whereas it took us maybe a week to develop the, the model for the resistance mapping, uh, and then a couple of days to actually run the model. So we mapped out the, the road crossing hotspots, uh, and we found, like we expected, they were species specific. So uh, the reptile and amphibians were in the same location. The mammals is the, the other location. But just to give you an idea, these kind of thin, precise hotspots of where animals were crossing um, are really, really useful in identifying exactly where a crossing structure should, should go. Um, however, in contrast, the uh, circuit, or the, sorry, the resistance mapping uh, had fewer hotspots, but these hotspots were much wider as well. So essentially kind of what we were seeing was uh, this area that I'm circling with my mouse uh, kind of corresponds for, to this large chunk in general. So what we're really seeing is kind of a lumping of these hotspots together, which uh, if you're unable to kind of discern where exactly that hotspot is and how that relates to um, one species or another can be challenging. Um, between the two methods, the distribution of these hotspots were the same for reptiles and amphibians. So they, they did present in the same location. They were just lumped. Uh, but concerningly for mammals, they actually told us a different story. So where animals were crossing were not where uh, current was crossing the road. Um, and so this might relate to the fact that it, important crossing locations may be kind of underrepresented in um, road crossing hotspots. Um, generally, though, uh, collecting data along a road is incredibly costly and inc incredibly labor intensive. Um, it does deliver more hotspots and narrower hotspots, which are really useful in pinpointing where a crossing structure, a structure should go. Um, but uh, the resistance models are much uh, less expensive, they're quick. Uh, and so what we kind of suggest is that using both of these things in conjunction can really optimize mitigation planning, um, especially because road surveys are important for collecting baseline mortality if you want to evaluate how effective mitigation is in the long run. So there's a few things uh, that like uh, are still important to consider, I guess. Um, one is just the effectiveness of structures. The, the, the study that I presented is one of the only ones that has used this type of design. Um, but there's also um, groups of people working towards more efficient crossing structures uh, to make them less expensive and so therefore more easily implemented. Um, 
Other forms of linear transportation are also incredibly uh, problematic. However, roads are incredibly uh, well studied comparatively. Uh, this is some research that we did about railroads and virtually no studies uh, uh, concerning railroads are, uh, are published. And then finally, outreach is an important component of all this, um, whether or not people are engaged and, or not. And I, I think specifically youth outreach is really important step. Um, with that, I think I'm all done, but I, during the question period, I'd be happy to chat and answer any of your questions. Thanks. Cool. Right. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Sean. Uh, we're pretty much keeping to time, so that's, uh, that's good. Um, and uh, that's a really interesting set of data and lots of food for thought, I think, there. Uh, so, however, we'd better go on to our next talk. <clears throat> and so our uh, next speaker uh, today is uh, Ben Harris, uh, who is very close to Frog Life because he's a current employee of uh, Frog Life. He's had a good number of experience of uh, reptile surveys in particular, um, and uh, moved to a job with Frog Life uh, last year. Rather awkward time in which to take up such a post, given the difficulty of carrying out any field work in the pandemic. Um, but uh, Ben's going to be talking about reptile road mortality. What do we know? Ben. Thank you, Roger. Right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so, yeah, my name is Ben Harris. Uh, so I currently run a reptile citizen science project here at Frog Life. And I want to give you a really quick overview just on reptile road mortality and what do we currently know. And this is specifically looking at UK reptiles um, and really focusing on the common and widespread reptiles that we have here. So let's just explore first the effect uh, roads might be having on reptiles. And we'll begin with the negatives. And the most obvious one uh, is that it's going to cause direct collisions. So vehicles are going to hit reptiles on roads or crossing roads. And more often than not, that is going to cause death to the, the individual. It's going to cause a fatality. But an indirect effect, and perhaps even more uh, sort of insidious, is the fragmentation of the habitat um, that the road actually causes. So the construction of roads is going to remove a certain proportion of the habitat, but the habitat that is left behind uh, is going to be fragmented. Okay, and we, we know that reptiles make poor colonizers, so this has a significant effect on them. And just to put it into perspective, um, it's been suggested that adders may only occupy about 30% of the suitable habitat that's available to them in the UK. So the more that we end up fragmenting, the worse it becomes for that, for that species, really. It might be worth considering if there's any potential positives. So some roads may have features on either side um, that may act as um, dispersal corridors. So think of scrub, long grass or hedgerows really good for reptiles to move along to get from one place to another. And also road verges may actually be used for basking as well. And um, quite often road verges might be sloped and if they're south facing and have open ground, these might make ideal basking spots. However, what we really need to consider as well, if we are considering potential positives, is whether attracting reptiles to roads because of these actually just ends up in more direct collisions? Does it mean there's more fatalities, even if there are um, potential positives? And I suppose another consideration as well is that larger roads, such as highways and roads with a lot of heavy traffic on, they're gonna cause a lot of noise pollution, they're gonna cause a lot of ground vibration, and that is gonna deter reptiles away from them, um, potentially negating any positive the road might have. So we're just going to take a very quick look at some of the research that's been done. Um, and the first thing that, that pops out to me really is that reptiles are really underrepresented in comparison to other taxa. Okay, there is a lot of good research on mammals and on amphibians, but reptiles are a little bit under the radar. 
Okay, and I imagine this is due to the difficulty in collecting the data. So you would need a huge amount of survey effort, really, uh, to collect all the, the roadkill data on reptiles. For example, if we compare them to amphibians, um, so toads in the UK, we, we do a lot of work you know, on toads on our roads, and it's pretty, pretty easy to, to estimate when they're gonna be moving and even where they're gonna be moving. You know, they'll be migrating to their, their breeding ponds. It's not possible really to do that for reptiles. You'd have to survey a lot of road and you'd have to do it um, very frequently as well to make sure that the roadkill isn't removed by scavengers, uh, that it's not just ground to dust or even just washed away um, by weather. So we do see that they are underrepresented because of this. The majority of research on reptile roadkill uh, has been conducted in America. And there's really good evidence to suggest that roads have direct and indirect effects on reptile populations. However, the UK has a very different uh, species assemblage, different population densities, even our road networks are built slightly differently, and there's climate differences as well. So a lot of the research in America, um, it makes it difficult to extrapolate some of the findings to our species here in the UK. However, there has been some research done in Europe where there's perhaps more similarities to justify some assumptions. But that really does bring me to my first key message here. And it's that we need more research on road mortality in reptiles in the UK. And we need, to, we need that research to fully understand whether direct collisions are having an impact on reptile populations. So that's the first key message here. We need some of the great minds to help design some studies on how we collect this data and make sure that data is robust enough to analyze um, whether it's having an effect on population dynamics. But just taking a look at the European research, there's a number of um, key themes that pop up. And these are the, the things that sort of um, I'd like to highlight really. And the first of these are, well, there is a lot of good data to support that reptiles are dying on the roads, okay? Reptiles are susceptible to road collisions. It is happening, right? But we need more data to analyze population dynamic impacts. Now, the majority of fatalities are to snake species and particularly on smaller roads and where the road is adjacent to that species preferred habitat. So lizard fatalities um, have been found, they have been recorded. Those lizard fatalities tend to be associated with basking, whereas the snake fatalities um, are maybe considered due to the movement throughout the snake's home range. And interest, interestingly, uh, juveniles may be more at risk of direct collisions on the road uh, than adults. And this makes sense to me because it's my understanding that the majority of, of dispersal within reptiles happens at this life stage, right? So juveniles may be more at risk. So are our UK species at risk? Well, the most likely species that's going to suffer is the grass snake. So the majority of the recorded reptile road kills in the European studies belong to the uh, Natrix genus which is the genus our native grass snake belongs to. So in terms of absolute numbers, it's likely that grass snakes uh, probably make up the majority of the roadkill. But like I say, we don't have any <laughs> published data in the UK really uh, to fall back on to, to confirm this. Slow worms were recorded as roadkill as well. So even though there's fewer slow worm records, um, the fatalities belonging to slow worms are likely to be due to the fact that their preferred habitat is often found on road verges and at the side of roads. And even though slow worms aren't as you know aren't found basking as openly as other reptiles, um, you know, warm surface, so tarmac heats up very quickly, is likely to be quite appealing to, to a slow worm on a, a colder day, and they may just creep out from cover and bask on the side of a road and uh, get hit by a car, essentially. Now, there certainly was less data um, for roadkill on the Vipera genus, so the genus our adder belongs to, but there's still a concern here, really. Um, there was some data 
collected on, on roadkill on adders. And it's a particular concern because we know that adders exist in quite small numbers. And if one or two are taken out by vehicles uh, and die, this might lead to a demographic imbalance. It's gonna reduce the genetic diversity of that, that local site and may actually lead to a sort of local stochastic extinction. So even though there is less data, it's still a concern. So overall, is road mortality a conservation concern for UK reptiles? Possibly, we know, and it's, we, 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 we can pretty much say that they are gonna be dying on our roads, but we definitely need more UK-based research to understand the impact it's having on the population. Uh, and perhaps a bigger concern, and we do have a bit more evidence for this, is the effect roads have on fragmentation. So fragmentation is a massive problem um, for, the, for reptiles in this country. And again, adders we know are mostly found in small numbers on isolated sites. So this is of serious conservation concern. So just going over some mitigation options, what can we do uh, to try and reduce the effects of uh, roads on, on reptiles. Fencing could be a solution. Um, so fencing can definitely reduce uh, road mortality. So literally just lining the side of a, um, of a road with some form of barrier that limits the, the reptiles from crossing and therefore uh, limiting the risk. But if we just provide miles and miles and miles of barriers, uh, we are just gonna make fragmentation worse. And that's not going to you know, just affect our, our reptiles, that's going to affect other terrestrial species as well. So using fencing in conjunction with, with tunnels, um, so fencing that, that funnels reptiles into an underpass or something similar uh, to safely reach the other side of the road is going to be far more preferable than just providing lots of, of fencing. Okay, and, and these tunnels need to be uh, placed quite frequently as well. I imagine a lot of species will only travel a certain distance along fencing um, and if they don't reach a tunnel they will just give up. And there's good research to suggest that road tunnels help amphibians. Okay, they are going to help reduce road mortality and they've been proven to um, improve site connectivity as well particularly where you have good terrestrial and wetland habitat on either side of the road. So the amphibian isn't by necessity trying to reach, you know, the other side just to get to a breeding pond. So it could be, you know, those tunnels could be used to help reptiles, but we do need to adapt them. And um, there is a fantastic study done in the Netherlands where they have designed something called a um, herpetoduct, which is essentially, again, it's an underpass, um, but it is far more open and it actually has cover objects uh, within it. I think they use tree stumps um, and this is far more inviting to the reptiles. So they will actually use this structure um, to, to one, not cross the road and two, um, it sort of improves site connectivity. So it could help with reptile road mortality. But again, we just need more research on whether these are effective for UK species uh, and here within this country. And these tunnels may also be important to resolve the fragmentation issues as well. So I think there was a record of an adder actually using these tunnels. So there's definitely the possibility um, that they, they, might be, they might be using them. So that was really the whistle stop tour of um, what we know on, on reptile road mortality. Uh, I just want to take this opportunity to, to sort of highlight that we have a wildlife tunnel campaign currently uh, going. Um, we want more tunnels in our roads, specifically for amphibians. Um, and the toad is really the flagship species for this. We know there's been a huge decline in toads over the last 30 years, partly due to the, to the number we lose um, on roads every year. And wildlife tunnels are going to help mitigate against this. Um, so I believe the link's been posted in the chat right now. Make your voice heard, please sign this. Uh, we want to see more wildlife tunnels uh, on our roads. So thank you for listening. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. My email address is up on screen. Um, back to, to Roger, thank you very much. 
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ben. That was uh, very nicely to time. And uh, basically saying we need more data. <laughs> well, that's often the case, isn't it? So, right, now to the final uh, presentation of the formal part of uh, this uh, webinar. Uh, today we have uh, Hugh Warwick, uh, who is well known in the UK, possibly internationally, um, as a as a, an author, ecologist, particular passion for hedgehogs, and is a spokesperson for the British Hed Hedgehog Preservation Society. Um, I notice uh, he uh, posted a, a contribution to International Women's Day uh, a couple of days ago by noting that a uh, preponderance of his uh, Facebook, group, Facebook group on hedgehog highways are women, 80%, which is uh, an interesting uh, observation in itself. Um, they have a campaign at the moment uh, about Hedgehog Street, the idea of connectivity being really important for hedgehogs, and I'm sure he's going to be talking about that and other aspects of hedgehogs in his presentation. So over to you, Hugh. Uh, Roger, thank you very much, and I shall do the, the subtle um, share screen thing, and here we go. Hopefully get to my presentation, and it wouldn't be right to end uh, a fascinating webinar without the standard, uh, the standard joke of why did the hedgehog cross the road? Um, and the answer to that is because our planning system is so abject in its ability to recognize the importance of habitat connectivity for wildlife that the hedgehog had no choice but to cross the road. Um, and so not quite the punchline you might have been hoping for, but uh, we shall move on from there. Um, I'm actually, was talking of jokes. I mean, the hedgehog crossing the road joke, it is a, a staple. Um, and many of you may remember back to the good old days of the not nine o'clock news um, and, and, and just the hedgehog sandwich. It used to be such a common thing uh, to see hedgehogs squashed on the roads so that they could become shorthand uh, um, um, cartoons in, in newspapers and uh, uh, jokes and songs on, on primetime TV. In fact, so uh, uh, important were they recognized uh, uh, as a species on the roads that the Department for Transport decided to use the hedgehog to teach children how to cross the road safely. I always thought this was a slightly strange choice of species. Uh, the one animal that children most likely to see squashed on the road is the one that they're supposed to be taking lessons from and um, probably a animal which wasn't being squashed on the roads might have been a better teacher. I raised this with the Department for Transport uh, because that's the sort of thing I do and they recognised um, that this was a slightly odd choice but uh, um, the stickers had been so popular that they just kept going with it. And I love the idea that they're measuring the efficacy of their project uh, through sticker uh, uh, attachment rather than uh, um, living children. Anyway, uh, moving on to the more serious uh, side of things. Um, I work with the British Hedgehog Preservation Society and we work together with the People's Trust for Endangered Species. Most of the research uh, um, I'll be talking about is, is the combined effort. And um, it's always slightly frustrating at this time in the cycle. Uh, we are going to be, towards the end of this year, publishing the State of Britain's Hedgehogs 2021. Um, so this is the, the end of the, the last lot of data. Um, we've got this, uh, but the particular uh, collection of data show that hedgehog population in the UK is down by 30% in urban areas and 50% in rural areas since the year 2000. Um, um, there is some relatively good news in that, and that is that the urban population seems to have leveled off in its decline, but the rural populations are still in free fall. There are many, many reasons why this is happening, um, but we're going to obviously focus on one particular one at the moment. It is possibly slightly ironic that our most robust surveying technique um, is uh, uh, mammals on roads. The People's, Tr People's Trust for Endangered Species Survey, citizen science um, at its best since the year 2001, uh, over half a million uh, kilometers of road have been surveyed initially, vast numbers of bits of paper um, inscribed by the passenger in a car were collected and sent in. Obviously now things have moved on a little bit and, and we are not, uh, obviously now we're not alone in having an app to do these things as well. Again, obviously it is the passenger of the car who does all of this. Um, and uh, this produces a lot of really valuable data. Now we're always being, I'm always being asked uh, when I'm in the media, how many hedgehogs are there? We 
don't have an easy answer to the total number of hedgehogs. Um, nothing that we can uh, uh, give a sort of robust degree uh, um, to. Uh, but what we do know is how things are changing over time through the various surveys which we run. Now, as I say, the People's Trust do the Mammals on Roads. They also do Living with Mammals, another citizen science project. Um, um, if you've got an interest in um, helping these things further, then please do get in touch with them and look for their surveys. Obviously, the BTO and their garden work, uh, the bird work is, is amazing, and they also sample for hedgehogs. Um, so there's a number of different surveys out there, and, and we luckily have um, very clever people at the People's Trust, thank you Dave, um, um, who, who pull all, this, all these data together to give us these ideas of population change. Um, and it's one of the, uh, uh, from sort of the statistical point of view, this is way beyond my comfort zone, um, but uh, uh, Paul Bright went through um, the Mammals on Roads data looking to check uh, that the, the fact which I suppose it's in, there is an obvious thing. If you've got a road uh, um, and you've got no cars on the road, then you're going to have no hedgehogs. Um, you know, that's inevitable. Uh, there's gonna be no squashed hedgehogs on there because there's no cars. And if you've got a, a, a busy road, which is, which is completely in gridlock, um, again, you'll have no squashed hedgehogs or other animals for that matter on the road. So it's not a, a perfect measure but um, what Paul Bright was able to do was to show that uh, um, um, for an important part of that continuum, uh, we do get a clear idea of the proportion of uh, the change in, in species um, uh, in, in the wider landscape, given uh, by a look at the count of the numbers found dead on the roads. Um, so it's, it's something which is, is obviously important. I, I was contacted by a lot of media um, last summer because I think, I think it was Project Splatter had put out something about the reduction in number of hedgehogs being seen on the roads. Um, and, and this was probably due to the fact that fewer hedgehogs were being run over uh, because fewer people were driving. But that was also tied in with the fact that there were fewer people observing hedgehogs squashed on the roads because they weren't out there as well. Um, so anyway, this is, it's not perfect, but it gives you a good indication of, of what is happening. And certainly my experience of watching hedgehogs, it's not always the obvious roads, which are the ones which cause the most uh, uh, um, trouble. Uh, radio tracking in Devon, not this particular hedgehog because the one I'm gonna talk about was called Nigel and you can always know who Nigel is. Um, but when I was radio tracking in Devon, Nigel, I followed him feeding along a single lane uh, um, road and um, uh, he would walk along the tarmac feeding uh, on the small invertebrates that I imagine were being brought uh, closer to the relative warmth of, of the tarmac um, and, and feeding on those. Um, not Nigel, but two of my hedgehogs got run over on that narrow road, yet there was a dual carriageway uh, just a couple of hundred metres away and none of my hedgehogs uh, uh, went down to that. Um, so we've got a degree, we have to be careful about the assumptions we make, but I'm relying on the statisticians to be able to uh, sort those things out. So we can use the, the data of the numbers being uh, uh, run over to give us a population idea of population change, but what about the numbers actually killed? Um, so I was very pleased when Dave Wembridge uh, uh, reassessed uh, the data. Now, Pat Morris, uh, sort of my mentor when it comes to all things hedgehog, had made a, a rough estimate of between 15 and 16,000 hedgehogs killed on roads um, each year. But this was a degree, uh, an order of magnitude less than, than figures from the Netherlands and from, from Belgium. So um, Dave and others uh, uh, re-attacked the data. And, um, uh, data stretching from 1952 back up to 2004 from four different surveys uh, came up with a figure of between 167 and 335,000 hedgehogs killed on the roads each year. Now, um, that upper figure has to be taken, in fact, both figures now have to be taken with a pinch of salt, given population decline even since 2004. And um, when I spoke to Dave uh, a couple of days ago, yeah, back of the envelope, roughly about 100,000 hedgehogs are being killed on the roads each year. And that uh, um, is combined with a mammal society population estimate for hedgehogs of around half a, half a million. So we're looking at about a 20% um, uh, population uh, um, take each year uh, uh, from, from uh, road casualties. Now, obviously, a lot of the animals being killed on the roads each year could be young, which you know, don't carry through to the spring population estimate. But even so, we're seeing what has to be considered a population, a conservation level impact. Um, 
and a really important uh, piece of work done by Lauren Moore part of, as part of her PhD. This is in the issue of animals, which was wonderfully full of just hedgehog research. Uh, and um, I, I rarely get that excited about scientific uh, publications, but this one really did. And it was interesting uh, um, seeing uh, her review of, of data across Europe and, and seeing that this idea, about 20% of, of a population being taken, it, it fits into um, the sort of range of figures that she'd found from the Netherlands, Poland, um, and Sweden, as well as, as the UK. So we've got an issue, and, and it was, uh, um, uh, it was uh, Ben talking about it as well. We've got the issue of hedgehogs, animals being killed on the roads, but also we have to consider the impact that the road has on more than just uh, uh, mortality, and that is on, on the fragmentation. And, um, and certainly with the hedgehog, uh, we see, um, oh, I must, sorry, this is a plug. A blatant plug. Uh, Lauren is giving a, um, a talk with with Grace Johnson, who is the officer, the Hedgehog Street officer, um, on the 23rd of March as part of the Field Studies Council. Um, uh, please do uh, um, um, quickly scribble a note down and sign up to that. Uh, it will be a, a, a much uh, more in-depth look at what I'm skimming through right now. Um, um, so, yeah, the issue of fragmentation is one which is very close to my heart. And, um, and this is the blatant advert in the middle of the TV programme, as it were. Uh, so I wrote a book recently called Linescapes, uh, Remapping and Reconnecting Britain's Fragmented Wildlife, because on so many issues that I've met and spoken to people about when researching books and doing other bits of work, um, uh, the mortality that comes with the collision with everything from ships at sea through to uh, um, um, you know, toads on roads, uh, is combined with the, the way that these roads and our transport infrastructures fragment the landscape. And um, uh, I do highly recommend that to you. Um, the road network is something which is, there's the obvious bit, the squashed hedgehog on the road, but this is the ring road around Oxford. And uh, there was a horrible car accident about uh, 10, 15 years ago. And uh, the, the response was to put in concrete barriers uh, for at least two and a bit kilometers stretch along here between uh, a nature reserve and suburban East Oxford. Um, I've talked to Highways England about the, the transformation of our roads from being very difficult to cross um, uh, for terrestrial animals to being impossible to cross for terrestrial animals. And they explained to me that there's no need to get another environmental impact assessment on these things because uh, it all fits within their permitted development. It was a, a really interesting moment and realization that, that there is a transformation happening. I, I mean, obviously our motorways are very, very hard for terrestrial wildlife to cross. But in many instances, and certainly uh, my recollection, the M4, I think it is, uh, um, has become vast areas of it, of it have now got these concrete barriers as well. So uh, um, we, have, we have now got these absolute agents of fragmentation. And obviously the, the fragmentation can happen at many different levels. This is uh, the, the uh, canalized ditch, which is about 50 meters behind me. Uh, they put it into this nice vertical wall structure to stop flooding. Well, that worked well. Um, and uh, um, it's also a fantastic pitfall trap. I've rescued four hedgehogs from here in the last 20 years. I don't often walk past it in daylight. Um, and uh, it, any a hedgehog falling in there simply cannot get out um, and, and will die. We have these moments of fragmentation all over the place. And the reason why that's important is because despite our little hedgehogs appearing very small and not necessarily needing very far to travel, uh, they have uh, quite an exploratory nature. And uh, this is work from Nigel Reeve, radio tracking uh, one male hedgehog over a, an 18 hole golf course in Surrey. You can see it managed an entire round over 12 nights. And um, the thing about this is, this is a 30 hectare golf course. Um, and, and what he found was that the, uh, um, that the females tended to move about a kilometer a night, males about two kilometers a night, uh, that the home range of females was about 10 hectares, the home range of, of males was about 30 hectares. They, they don't have a territory they defend, they have home ranges which they share somewhat grumpily. And the reason this is significant is because when you start to take this a little bit further, put it into a minimum viable population analysis, um, thank you Tom Morehouse at Wild Crew for doing that for us, um, you find that a viable population population of hedgehogs, you need a starting population of you know, 32, roughly, um, in a good habitat, which actually, this is a pretty good habitat, uh, but they need 90 hectares of unfragmented landscape. That's nearly a square kilometer 
not chopped up by a canal, by a really uh, by a busy road, by uh, new fencing and a new development, by by whatever. All of these agents of fragmentation. Now, obviously, our islands are not completely uh, um, cut, isolated and cut off. They're not out in the middle of the Pacific, but they're still islands uh, to quite an extent. And um, I just want to uh, share with you um, uh, some GPS data from um, Jessica Schaus uh, from working at Nottingham Trent University on a People's Trust funded PhD. Um, I love this, partly because you watch the dots move and it's quite hypnotizing. Um, you also look at the, um, um, the, the, the difference between male and female, uh, the red one down at the bottom, keep an eye on that male. Um, but also I look at it and think, um, wow, life has got much easier for these researchers because this is essentially impossible data to gather by radio tracking. Uh, it would have just been an absolute nightmare. But um, to be able to, to release these animals and collect the data after they've done their jaunt is, is quite astounding. I like the fact they get up at eight o'clock roughly on the dot uh, in May in Brighton. Um, so this shows you just how many gardens these hedgehogs will move between. And you can see the busy road across the top up there. Why did the hedgehog cross the road? It crossed the road because it didn't have the choice because the too many barriers elsewhere to stop them being able to move to reach food, shelter and potential mates. And that's what these hedgehogs need to be able to do. And obviously that's why we launched uh, the campaign Hedgehog Street because you can make your garden hedgehog friendly and, um, and that's fantastic. But if the hedgehog uh, uh, can't get in, it's useless. Um, and so you make the hole in your fence so the hedgehog can get in. And just um, a little bit of uh, um, self praise here. We have now, we are now celebrating our 10th birthday, 10 years of the collaboration between the British Hedgehog Preservation Society and the People's Trust for Endangered Species. It's been fascinating and I say a real privilege to work with some wonderful people along the way. Um, and what we're doing is campaigning to get this idea further. We need to push through those fences, make the connections between gardens, try and make sure that we have these areas up to nearly a square kilometre opened up. And it's been amazing watching people do that. Um, please sign up to the Hedgehog Street campaign, become uh, a, a, one of our supporters and make a hole in your wall or fence or whatever. It's hard work cutting holes into brick walls. I've done it and, it, and also I, I don't like power tools, but it's hard work. So much better if we can have concrete gravel boards coming ready cut. And uh, um, this is something which we've been, been encouraging uh, fence manufacturers to be able to, to supply. And actually, wouldn't it be better if, if we didn't have to even replace these things? But when new housing estates were um, uh, set up, uh, we actually had them uh, um, coming with, with these holes in place. And here we go. This is the posting that Roger commented on earlier, International Women's Day. And yes, it is relevant to hedgehogs. Trust me. Um, I launched a campaign a couple of years ago on change.org. Um, here we go. Change.org slash save our hedgehogs. And you will notice near the top there that we are at 970,215 signatures. I really want to get to a million. So please, if you would be so kind as to sign up if you want to, but also to uh, spread the word, spread the love as far as you can. Not only do you get the good feeling of signing up to the petition, calling on all developers uh, to be forced to put in um, hedgehog highways as standard, uh, but also once every week or so you get a letter from me. Um, uh, that isn't a threat, that's a promise. And it's, it's, it's often quite fun, um, and, and, but obviously educational as well. And the benefits that have come from this have been quite astounding. I mean, I, we've got uh, one of the biggest developers in uh, the country, uh, Bovis Homes, now part of the Vistry Group, uh, are committed to having all new developments where possible with hedgehog highways built in. Uh, we've got the um, uh, we got a change to the national planning policy framework uh, such that there is guidance now that all developments should come with hedgehog highways, but there are no teeth attached to the guidance. And I'm keeping going with the campaign until, well, obviously government's a bit busy at the moment, but I'm hoping that they will eventually start to come and think of other things and we will retackle this. It'd be great to get teeth attached to it. But what's also happening is individuals are helping with this uh, um, because they're noticing new developments in their area and they're contacting the developers themselves. And the key point of this is you get holes in those fences, you are reducing the number of journeys hedgehogs are going to take crossing roads and therefore reducing the number of chances that hedgehogs will get at being run over. 
Um, there is also a, a Facebook group, the Hedgehog Harvest Facebook group, over 17,000 members on there. Um, it's an amazing array of people um, who have got the most wonderfully cunning ways of making holes, getting feeding stations set up. Um, and it would be lovely to get some more of the science in there as well. So please have a think and a look. And um, just on the petitioning thing, we also have the British Hedgehog Preservation Society trying to get the hedgehog shifted from Schedule 6 to Schedule 5 of the Wildlife and Countryside Act. Now we know it's not simple, we know it's not a panacea, but um, it would be absolutely wonderful to get up to the 100,000. We have we got to the 10,000 and the government said, ha, no. Um, we get to 100,000, we hopefully will end up with a debate in Parliament. And this gives us an opportunity to really begin to push the message that the hedgehog is deeply vulnerable to many threats, but in particular uh, to being killed on the roads and to the fragmentation that the roads uh, create themselves. And we can, if we are willing to treat it seriously, we can overcome some of these problems. Um, and uh, there, far more research needs to be done on the use of tunnels for hedgehogs. Um, Silvio Petrovan obviously has done an awful lot of work on this. Uh, but I, I look at what's happened in the Netherlands, in Canada, in France, in Germany. Um, I'm sorry, I stole this picture without editing it. And we've also got the Christmas Island uh, um, crab migration, which may not be so relevant to us, but even so, you know, climate change. Um, you know, if we are going to be treating these things seriously, if we're going to treat nature seriously, we need to start investing properly in ensuring our landscape is connected. The Netherlands for a long time had a, a, a rule that all new planning uh, all new infrastructure that was planned, if it was going to cause any fragmentation, had to have an eco duct built into it. There are complications at the moment in the Netherlands, but hopefully they will return to that sort of thing. It's really exciting when you see it work. Um, and there is one eco duct almost, the A5556 near Nutsford, um, and it's 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 small, but it's a start. It shows that these things can happen if people are willing to put their minds to it. And, and occasionally we'd surprise ourselves. Well, I surprise, I find myself getting surprised. Whilst I was researching landscapes, one of the places I wanted to visit um, was the Devil's Punch Bowl near Leatherhead in Surrey. And the A3 had uh, um, cut a, a, a course around the top of, of this amazing natural amphitheater. Um, and it was an absolute bottleneck. And um, I, I cut my campaigning teeth at Twyford Down, uh, learning that if I sit in front of bulldozers, large people throw me around and I didn't like it very much, but luckily other people are better at that sort of thing than me. Um, and I, uh, the plan had been to essentially do to the Devil's Punch Bowl what they did with the amazing Twyford Down outside Winchester to expand the M3. Um, and I don't know whether it's anything to do with the high concentration of barristers and bankers that live in that area, but somehow the lobbying and the campaigning uh, they did managed to get a transformation, which is something quite remarkable. And it, when I went there, even though it's not brand new, I was still absolutely, my breath was taken by this. Um, I, I spoke to people who live here, they talked about the first day the road was closed and how that was the first day that they heard birdsong again. This environment has been transformed. It's now got the highest proportion, uh, highest density, sorry, highest density of, of, of golden Labradors in the entire country. And at the weekend, gentlemen who wear red trousers. I um, mean, it's a very specific sort of environment, but it is an environment which has been transformed because people were willing to take nature seriously and build a tunnel. Um, and this is talking about valuing nature. I, I don't even want to start about a natural capital argument because that sucks. But this is treating nature with value. They gave it a one point, uh, was it 155,000 pounds per meter for 1.8 kilometers of tunnel. Um, yeah, so it's not cheap, but it just shows that when there is a will, they can seriously do amazing things. And I really, really hope that this is how we can begin to start to treat nature seriously. Now, when uh, uh, Professor Sir John Lawson published his Making Space for Nature white paper back in 2010, he argued that we needed 1.1 billion pounds per year to uh, ensure our wildlife spaces were bigger, better, uh, um, there were more of them and, and that, that they were properly connected. And, and that sounded like such an outlandish amount of money. But 1.1 billion pounds a year in the big picture, it's if we got rid of a nuclear missile system that we cannot use, that's 200 years sorted. Um, if we hadn't been quite so generous with the banks, that was a thousand years sorted. And if we maybe 
questioned uh, what we've done with um, track and trace, hmm, well, that's 37 years sorted as well. The money can be there, and we need to start making a really crucial argument for the value that nature gives to us. Uh, and I don't mean that in pounds and pence. I mean in the sense that it's utterly priceless. Um, on the smaller scale, how do we act? Uh, those are all the big pictures. Well, there was a push at the Department for Transport released new signs last year. Very exciting. For the first time ever, I thought that this was a sign which was designed to protect wildlife. I mean, the, the wildlife signs for the deer and for the toads, the deer signs are to warn you not to crash into big animals that might hurt you. And the toad signs are there to warn you about the skid risk. I thought the hedgehog sign was there to warn you about places with lots of small mammals crossing. Unfortunately, I got that wrong. And it is one of the most absurd ideas that ever has been. And um, reflected in the fact that just four councils have requested to use this sign. They've all been denied because they can't meet the criteria of having enough accidents and injury caused by hedgehogs. Um, as in that the people swerved to avoid them rather than, well, you'll see the last slide, what's been happening. Um, so this is a nonsense. And um, I mean, in partly in response to this sort of thing. Uh, the ghost hedgehog idea was launched in Dorset, the Dorset Mammal Group. And what they've done there is they've been getting these, they're make, getting cutting wooden hedgehogs, it's mine, um, and, uh, and when they find dead hedgehogs on the roads, um, they put out a little white hedgehog as a little ghost, as a reminder of what has been there. It's not quite an official sign, um, so you have to be careful where you cite it. My hope is that we can begin to start treating wildlife being killed on our roads seriously and that we can start to treat the fragmentation effect um, seriously uh, before the inevitable consequences, uh, which is the evolution of much bigger hedgehogs. Thank you very much for listening and I will, um, I'll get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much, Hugh, for uh, an inspiring as well as uh, entertaining uh, talk and uh, I'm sure that lots of people will wish to sign the petition if they have not already done so. So um, now that gets us to the end of the formal presentations for today's uh, webinar uh, and uh, with any luck that gets me out of my duties mm -hmm. and I think I can hand over to Cathy who's going to monitor the question and answer session. Is that right Cathy? Yeah, that's correct. Okay, I'm just scrolling through them. There are quite a few questions here. We'll see how many we can get through. And I'm trying to find a way of saving these so that we can address some of the others afterwards. Um, Roger, can you give me a um, hands up at 15.40 so I give Jules five minutes to close off? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so I've just gone right up to the beginning. So this is a, um, a, a question for Adobo, um, do you find any bias or correlation in the data set between number of records and human population density? More recorders, more records. I suppose that could be for anybody, actually. Yeah, if the question is for me, we have not looked into that, but uh, it's a good thing that we can, uh, maybe in the future, we, we, need, we can look into this aspect as well. Yeah. Does uh, any of the other panelists have any views on that? Yeah, I can add to that. With our data, you know, we're really subject to observer bias. So the more people are, are interested in recording, the, the more records we get. So, you know, if, if there's something in the press which happens every now and then, w even without us knowing about it, um, then we'll, we can get a surge in reports. And the way that we cope with that is for our spatial models, we have to use species distribution models so we use something called Maxent, which counts for the fact it's presence only data and there's bias. And then for our temporal stuff, we use the relative proportion, but it's, it's messy data, citizen science data, but it's also fantastic data. We wouldn't otherwise be able to have the spatial and temporal coverage that we do. I also got one question on my phone. I'm just going to look it up so I get it right. They couldn't access the Q and A box. Um, so they want to know, um, can, uh, can you ask the panelists for their views on road signs? Do they have data that show that they work, e.g. reduce mortality after signs go in, and what designs work best? Anybody? 
I, I can't necessarily quote the paper for you off the top of my head right now, but generally, at least what we found in Ontario, and I, I, I think some sources from outside of um, Canada as well, have shown that people will uh, initially react to road signage. Um, so they'll be more aware of the species on the landscape, whether it be moose or um, reptiles and amphibians. But uh, as time goes on, um, then the time window is usually about two or three weeks if people are driving through that stretch fairly often, that that sign just blends in with uh, uh, the, the rest of the landscape. And, and they've shown this with other types of signs as well. So if you uh, change the speed limit um, of a, a, a sign, uh, reduce the speed limit, people won't pay attention to it. But if it's a new sign, they'll pay attention for the first little bit. Uh, and then it, it just kind of gets blended into the background. Okay, yeah, I, I, I agree with Sean, actually. Um, so I can take examples from what we have tried in uh, addressing the uh, train hit uh, issue with elephants. So because railways, for that matter, I'm not looking into the roads right now, but uh, railways, for that matter, they look into these signs. They have the signaling uh, uh, protocols that they need to follow. So if you are putting up signs there and with the administration there, so they are actually... Uh, trying to reduce and we have saved a lot of uh, elephants because that the signs were there, the loco pilots which are driving these trains, they saw it and they reduced the sign and with the curves coming in and with the elephants in the middle, they have reduced it. So uh, these are uh, the sign is an important tool and we have used it in other places also for uh, notifying that this is an elephant um, corridor area. People have... Um, reduce their speed and we have seen a much more cautious approach to these particular stretches where the elephants do move. Uh, but as Sean said, it has to be revived uh, and uh, constantly on that regular basis and reflective ones like uh, with a yellow background and everything that actually helps. That's what we have seen in India actually. I don't know about other places. We did do a survey with the AA here in the UK where they do an annual series of questions and we threw in a couple about how do people react when they see signs that warn them of wildlife or, you know, deer, the deer and the duck one? And uh, people were absolutely outraged and they said that they don't slow down because they are always driving perfectly. Mm. And of course, that we know that is not the case. So people were completely outraged that we suggested they might, might drive recklessly near any kind of a sign. And, um, but of course, we still get all the wildlife roadkill. I suppose the next question can also um, relate to road closures. So it says, is there a danger with a night ban in a more densely roaded area that it just sets up the same problem just on a different road? And I suppose, as I say, that could also be road closures. Um, so if I, if I can take that question again, so I think uh, what we have tried in uh, the uh, place that I was talking about, Gorumara, yes, uh, the, uh, so it's about the cost benefit actually. Uh, there are alternative routes that the uh, vehicular traffic can be diverted to. Uh, again, the night ban was enforced because there was active patrolling in that region also. It's not just the signage. So there was active patrolling and we were able to restrict zero movement of any vehicular traffic. And we found the alternative road, which was also uh, a little uh, longer for the usual uh, uh, people to go around, but uh, was much more smoother and for them to not uh, kill wildlife was an added benefit for them. So it did work. Uh, I am also looking into the database that we have and we have worked in a place called Bandipur, which is in Southern India, again, a tiger reserve. And uh, there was again a night ban that was imposed there. And uh, um, it's actually, it does work uh, in terms of uh, uh, banning uh, night traffic there. And uh, Though there is a discomfort that happens with people, but they understand why it is uh, important to protect the wildlife there. Okay. I suppose just a quick um, follow up on that one, and then we'll move some questions to other panelists. Um, there was one that said, how do people respond to road closures? Well, I suppose anybody could say that if you've got any experience on that. No? <laughs> <laughs> The dissent is there, but uh, we need to make way and make them much more sensitive over the issue, I guess. 
And, and this is a question for you, Sarah. Is there a difference at the rate of reporting at different times of the year due to people on roads, etc.? How, how does this affect your data? Is there also a difference in level of reporting for different species, e.g. larger species easier to spot? Yeah, absolutely. So, so as I said, you know, our data are really quite subject to observer bias. So it might be more interesting or exciting for somebody perhaps to report a badger than it is for them to report a rat, or it's certainly easier to ID a badger. So yeah, there's definite bias in the data. So we have to be quite careful when we analyze and interpret that to look for the patterns. So we do also get people reporting to us at different time periods of the year, of course. Um, so, so yeah, we, we try to account for it using our analyses. And then I've got another one here um, that says, um, uh, they're interested in the influence on traffic lights, especially since you mentioned that the motorways are more deadly than B roads. Could it be that the animals are attracted, disorientated, affected by the road lights? And I know this is an interesting one from a toad perspective as well. With amphibian perspective? Uh, yes, it could be that there's some work done on the effect of uh, lighting and noise on animal behaviour. Uh, quite often it's a, it's a deterrent. And we ran a, an experiment last year that we called the Phantom Road, where we actually made a road in the woods. So we, we put up lighting and uh, played road noise. And the animals were reacting to the road noise rather than the lighting. And, and the, the noise was a deterrent. So it, it's hard to tell really. I mean, I think possibly why motorways are so deadly is because the traffic is driving so incredibly fast. And, and it's a you know, multi-lane. Okay, thank you. I'm just trying to find, um, make sure I'm getting uh, questions for everybody. Um, here's one that would um, cover quite a few of the subjects that have been covered. Um, are road closures favourable for a reason compared to installing mitigation such as tunnels? I think the, the biggest reason for this is just the cost associated with mitigation. Um, right, It's not just the, the, the cost of the fencing and the, the tunnels themselves, but then there's cost to install those things, cost surface the road, and then the maintenance costs associated with those things. Uh, and so depending on the situation, um, if a road closure can be done temporarily, I think that it's much more cost effective. Okay. Um, and then here's one for everybody as well. It's an interesting one. Does anyone have any thoughts on how electric cars will affect road kill? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, going back to our phantom road idea, the fact that noise was, was uh, producing different behaviors and was kind of a deterrent, um, but also changed foraging behavior on a few, I, I think there'll be positive and negative. So the, the road noise is a real deterrent. And of course that's the noise of the engine, right? Electric cars are really quite quiet, but the noise does also come from the tires on, on the actual road surface. So, um, yeah, electric cars can creep up on us somewhat. So I, I think there has been talk of, of adding noise to the electric cars so they can't do that to us and to wildlife. Um, there's a bit of a different question here as well. I'm not quite sure um, if anybody can answer. Um, it's a bit of a comparison to um, different types of mortality, I suppose. So the question is, is there significant kill in agricultural land? Is there much machine kill? or is the toxicity of pesticides more significant? Any data on this? Um, the work, I mean, the, the British, the, the hedgehog surveys have tended to show the hedgehogs leave farmland when given the choice. Um, and, and a lot of a farmed landscape is an ecological desert. I mean, if you look at macroinvertebrate uh, um, diversity and, and uh, biomass, um, you, you find yeah, it's just massively degraded. So therefore, there isn't a lot of incentive to be out there. I've, I've seen some, some fairly scary stuff from bug life showing the, the amounts of um, insect life either side of a hedge beside a busy road. 
and uh, the, uh, there's vast amounts more in where biomass and biodiversity on the verge side, the road side of the hedge than on the other side. Unfortunately, I can't quote a paper on that because I can't remember that. Um, but in terms of hedgehogs, yeah, they simply are leaving farmland because it is not a good place to be. Uh, there's just a, a comment here. Uh, gosh, I'm just going to. Yeah. Uh, the slide showing hog journeys starting at 8 pm on the dot in May should be mandatory viewing for all planners, developers, and politicians. <laughs> <laughs> I think that Jessica will be very pleased with that because it was very good data as well. <laughs> um, here's one that says What about retrofit for existing roads? It comes to money. I mean, that's the thing at the bottom of all of this. If there's money to be there to actually take nature seriously, then these things can be done. And yes, you can retrofit eco ducts across things. They're doing it or have done it in the Netherlands and they're doing it in Germany and they're doing it in France. And they're doing it in Canada. Um, Sean, I'm not sure. I don't know how much there is going on in Canada. Do you have any sort of indication, any idea? Uh, so it kind of varies depending on species. So uh, in Ontario specifically, I'll, I'll talk about because that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, there's two main highways that they've been twinning over the last, I don't know, 15 years or so. Uh, and with that highway twinning, they've done a lot of, um, you know, the, the, the addition of crossing structures and um, fences and so forth. But you're right, it really comes down to uh, how much more expensive it is to build these structures in a new road versus adding them to a road. Um, and there are quite a few structures, especially for reptiles and amphibians because of our species at risk legislations um, that are being built. Uh, but it really is, they're being timed for when those roads would need to be resurfaced anyways. If I can add to that as well, I think there's, there's a step before that and that we actually need the data to understand where mitigation should be put in and that you know that was a point that Ben made of course that we we lack quite a lot of data for some species in the UK and so even if we were given a blank checkbook we might not really know what to do with it initially. Um, is there a British standard i.e. BS for animal and IBO system road signs? I think the answer is no but <laughs> for road signs to be up they need to be they need to be passed by the department for transport and then be put up by local authorities um, mm. or if they're on the motorways obviously highway uh, highways england um or scotland or wales but the um no so so that we can't just we're not supposed to just go and stick up our own signs telling people to be nice um and then the question here is we have a high badger population in this part of essex we are very low on hedgehog numbers. Is there any link here? <laughs> how, lo how much longer do we have? Uh, <laughs> okay, so I can begin by introducing you to the asymmetric intraguild predatory relationship between badgers and hedgehogs. Um, I mean, we, we've we've done some some very you know, good work. Well, funded some very good research um, and which shows that uh, where you have an increased population of badgers you have a decreased population of hedgehogs however it is only the fleck mouthed uh, frothing uh, um, um, ecological illiterates who will jump up and down screaming for the death of badgers to save hedgehogs uh, because any excuse to kill badgers um, <laughs> it's a much more complex much more nuanced thing badgers principally fragment the landscape for hedgehogs uh, and out compete them for macroinvertebrates uh, badgers are blessed with um, um, a much more omnivorous diet and uh, uh, better digging capacity. And yes, they will predate them. Um, uh, radio tracking hedgehogs can be a very sorry affair when you're living in a caravan on your own and getting lonely and you name all your hedgehogs and then find a badger eat some of them. Um, so yes, they will, but it's, uh, it, is, it is not, it, it's not a very sort of uh, uh, nuanced view to consider the badger an enemy. They've, badgers and hedgehogs have coexisted since the retreat of the last ice sheet. Uh, they're doing, they can do fine if we've got a, uh, a, a, a less degraded ecosystem. Okay, great. Um, this one, I can partially respond and I'm sure others can um, input. So does anyone have in, an experience with the effect of light pollution on road mortalities? Do you find species avoid roads with high light levels? We have done some research on amphibians and we have found that light does deter them. Um, we've also done some research on um, when they, when toads are most likely to travel. 
And that is when there's a full moon, coming up to a full moon and just after a full moon, which also tends to give some idea of light. But I don't know if anybody else has anything. Are there any bat experts out there? Because I mean, bats are one of the most affected by, uh, um, uh, species affected by, by light. And um, uh, uh, I, unfortunately, I don't know enough to comment, but it'd be interesting to see if somebody could pop something up in, in chat or comments. I mean, Fiona Matthews has done some work on this recently and Emma Stone as well at University of West England. So um, they, they've both published on the effect of, of light on, on bats and of course certain species are affected by it. Just going back through because we've gone through those. I think we have posted the competition link and all the links in the chat box and that was just asking for that. Um, uh, I don't know, Roger, this might be, I'm not sure about this. Are camphored curbs on roads good mitigation for toads? You're asking me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not an expert. I'm just holding the jackets here. <laughs> Jules, you might know that. I'm so sorry, Kathy. <laughs> we'll have to come back to you on that one. I'm sorry. Well, I've got a quick question. Is that okay if I could just pop in? It's a yeah. bit of a niche question, but since we've got such a nice sort of global spread of people, um, a while ago I was uh, working on a uh, it was a, a writing project about snakes and I, I can't remember uh, where it was, but I came across a South American paper saying that, uh, well, hinting that that some um, some people in cars would actively run over snakes. And I just wonder if you, any of you guys said that. Uh, I can answer that. Um, it's really interesting. Uh, um, most of my field works in Trinidad in the West Indies and uh, Snakes there are regarded as all poisonous, despite the fact that only a few of them are. Um, and drivers will deliberately try to hit snakes. And I was going to ask uh, Debo actually about this in India, because I mean, I, I, I know there are a lot of interesting cultural interactions between snakes and people in India, and some snake species are considered as sacred animals. Yes. So, you know, what? how does that affect people's uh, interactions with uh, animals crossing roads. Yeah, absolutely. Like you actually said it right. Like the general perception is that nobody in India would like to actually kill an animal, whether it is elephants or whether it is snakes or whether it is a frog or anything. It's it's the usual thing is like not to hurt these because they are considered in some form or the other some something sacred. Uh, for that particular community or whether for that particular region. So it's not all, all over India that will have the same relation with that particular species. But yes, snake uh, is revered in India and uh, nobody particular will actually try to harm it. Though snake conflict is an issue in India and uh, we are trying to address it. But uh, mainly uh, in respect to road mortality, I don't think it's like people actually try and do it. Uh, yeah, but in snake conflict, like people, uh, snakes come into homes and uh, the uh, chances of getting bit is really there, but uh, nothing specifically on roads. Okay. Um... I, I definitely have seen drivers do that on, uh, on purpose as well, uh, kind of uh, in Ontario at least, it will swerve to hit turtles and snakes, uh, which is unfortunate because those are especially the ones that are kind of at risk from roads. Um, but uh, yeah, some people will definitely do it on purpose. Yeah, that's interesting. I can see in the comments that uh, someone called Erica, thank you very much, just posted that paper that was going on about. So yeah, that's fascinating. Thanks, guys. Okay, um, there's a question here that's for Sarah, but there's also been a question um, a bit further down about all the different data recording systems. And I don't know how it works in Canada and India, but um, in the UK, we have what's called the NBN. And um, we should all be submitting our data to the NBN for it to be shared. Um, so somebody asked with all the different recording systems um, that we have in the UK, are these being, um, are they collaborating and sharing the data? And then somebody here has also asked um, particularly 
for you, Sarah. How is the research from Project Splatter being used to reduce the impact of special mortality on our roads? And how is it being used to design new roads and infrastructure? So I suppose generally it's a it's a it's a question about how we're using research and data or data and research. Yeah, so firstly on the data sharing. Um, yeah, we put our data on NBN and, and we share it with people who are interested and people share their data with us. So uh, somebody did ask about the, the Badger groups, lots of Badger groups share their data with us. How we use those data to make a difference is a really tricky one. So Hugh mentioned in his talk about the, the Hedgehog Road signs. We, we were involved in that chat when Chris Grayling was the Secretary of State for Transport. But actually, when it comes to fruition, it, it, you know, is it really, is it really a good thing? Um, because there hasn't been fantastic uptake, and actually, turning the the science into policy is super, super tricky. So, you know, all I can say is, as long as we continue to publish, and we publish our work open access, then we're putting it out there for everybody to access, and we'll, we'll always try and do what we can do and support. Um, anybody who wants data for a particular cause. And I can say Fog Life um, operates very much along the same approach. Um, we always try and get public access for any research that we're publishing and we send our data annually to NBN. So um, yeah, we are sharing it openly. We've got a couple of minutes, well, we've got one minute. If anybody on the panel wants to add anything. Others, I think we covered most of the questions, I hope, but we will capture, see if we can capture the question on the Q&A box and just make sure. Okay, um, if that's it, I'll just say thank you again to everybody for attending and thank you to our speakers. I think you all gave absolutely terrific talks, very engaging incredibly informative and well I've really enjoyed the afternoon and from the chat in the chat box I think most people who have attended have really enjoyed it so thank you very much and as I say we hope to make this a, a series of seminars so we will be back um, or back in touch with other speakers or, or you again to find other speakers um, on, on other topics. So, um, so I'm going to hand over to Jules who is Folk Life's patron to just Close off. Oh, thank you very much, Kathy. And uh, it's always hard with these kind of Zoom things because there's no like audience here. But I'm just on behalf of everyone watching, I'm going to give a massive round of applause to you all because uh, that was just totally illuminating. Um, and it's just so wonderful um, in such a sort of cost efficient way to bring so many experts from across the world. It's fantastic to see that being done. So congratulations to you and thank you very much to those speakers. So I won't say um, too, too much, really. I just jotted down a few notes as I was listening away this afternoon. Um, and one of the things that comes across so, so heavily, I suppose, is that when I start, it's a bit embarrassing. When I start, I've noticed lots of the um, people attending today are parts of tow patrols. And that was like my first job. Um, so in the year 2000 or so, I would fill in the form to get the paper forms and put them all into like you know whatever it was windows microsoft 2000 or whatever at the time it was horrific anyway that was kind of the world i guess that i was in and actually seeing how far we've come in and the technological improvements and how uh, efficient i suppose that data capture system is now 20 years later is absolutely fantastic but the tow patrol scene you know you can see from the comments and the chat today it's still the same passion the same uh, energy and the same warm characters in there so it's been lovely to see that it's been really nice to see that um the different organizations as well that's something that's kind of been missing i think from the toads on road scene uh in the in the uk in those days is you know we weren't really listening massively to what was going on in europe and what was going on in north america and around the world actually so that's been absolutely fantastic i loved deba i absolutely loved the um i break for wildlife stickers and i think we should have that on our cars that's a really good idea so it's just been um as I said, really, I, I use the word energizing, but it's lovely to see that um, coming through in the chats and in your speakers today. So great job, guys. Thank you very much um, for that. This year has been kind of uh, just such a strange year for us. And 
I know so many countries are still in the midst of it. And obviously in Britain, we're still having a nightmare, really. But hopefully with some of the uh, vaccinations and the kind of warm times to come, we've got a really unique opportunity here. And we talked about, um, Sarah, you mentioned about um, the former transport secre secretary. And we, we've had a run in Britain anyway in the last four years of just this kind of endless chain of new politicians taking on those posts. Hopefully we've got a period of calm here. Um, we've got a, a position, I guess, to um, really lay out our stall as wildlife conservationists and really get the ears of those transport secretaries. And hopefully they'll stay in place for a while with a bit of stability. So on that note, I mean, Cathy mentioned at the start and it's been mentioned throughout, um, you know, this uh, tunnel campaign that Frog Life's got. Um, this petition that you can sign. And I wonder actually if, oh, look at that. Oh my gosh, you were ahead of, ahead of me, but in the chat, I can see you've just posted um, the link again. But you know, that petition, this is a great time to, um, to get uh, wildlife tunnels um, and other mitigation techniques on the government's um, agenda. And obviously we haven't talked much about climate change today, but obviously that's in all of our minds. And we know that as, as the climate changes, the animals are going to be able to, they're going to need to move uh, to suitable parts of their habitats. They're going to have to migrate in cases further north. You know, we are going to need an efficient um, wildlife road system. And with COP26 around the corner um, later this year, this is kind of like our time to strike. So please, I know it's so easy to forget, but right now, in a second, click on that link, sign that petition. And then this is the really crucial bit. This is the bit, this is the bit we always forget, I do anyway, is when it says, do you want to share this? Don't go, oh, I'll do it later share it because between us um you know look 164 of you are still here between us if we all shared that petition we could probably reach i don't know 60 80 000 maybe um just by that one act so we want to get that petition out there we want the numbers up there and just like your petition as well hugh this is a really important time for us to um to really make um, an impact and, and build on afternoons like this so um great job everyone uh, on behalf of everyone again, I'm going to give you a big round of applause and to the people behind the scenes. You, you wouldn't believe how many people are behind the scenes in the Frog Life office uh, making sure this is all run smoothly and it has run fantastically smoothly. So well done to everyone. If anyone's going toad patrolling tonight, like me, I hope you have a great evening. Enjoy those toads. Enjoy making such a big uh, impact on the UK conservation scene. So thank you very much, guys. I'm going to give a round of applause and then enjoy your evenings. Thank you very much, everyone, and we'll be back in touch. Thank you.